what is our lunch situation? It's as opposed to 1230 or the one that's possible in between 1230. Okay, well, are they bringing it in here or do we have to go out there? Yeah, they're going to bring it in here. Okay, so we're going to just keep going. Well, we'll get started and maybe we can take we those can people that have flights. That's fine, five minutes. We should have enough. Okay, so moving on to item seven, which is the proposed regulations to add title 16 CCR section 1776 related to prescription drug take back programs. And this is an item that we've reviewed um, several times at the board meeting. Uh, most recently at the January 2016 board meeting, the board approved proposed text to add section 1776 related to prescription drug take back programs. The 45 day comment period began on February 12th and ended on March 28th of this year. There were two regulation hearings that were held on April 13th, one in Northern California and one in Southern <coughs> California. The board received numerous comments during the comment period and at the regulation hearing. Um, at, the, uh, at this meeting, the board will continue the opportunity to discuss the regulation and determine the course of action it wishes to provide. The options we have are one, adopt the regulation as approved at the January 26th board meeting. Two, amend the regulation to address the concerns expressed by stakeholders and notice the modified text for a 15-day comment period or three, return the regulation to the Enforcement Committee for further discussion. Attachment one contains the proposed regulation text that was noticed on February 12th, 2016. Attachment two contains the public comments received during the 45-day comment period. Attachment three contains the comments from the few stakeholders that were at the regulation hearings for review. Um, attachment four contains a single comment received from 256 citizens from the San Francisco Bay Area, and attachment five contains a compilation document containing the specific uh, comments received during the 45-day comment period, and attachment six is an article on drug disposal kiosks and hospitals that was published in ASHP. Um, Debbie and I have been working with staff on taking and incorporating the public comments into a revised draft for the board's review, and that is actually included and was published on the board website Monday or Tuesday? I think it was yesterday. Yesterday, okay. And what we, what we d when we listened to the, when we heard the public comments that actually came back, a lot of them were regarding the issue of the word voluntary as to whether we do want to include voluntary or not. So in this particular draft that we've put, we removed the word voluntary from pharmacy participation. Um, it creates an issue with, in terms of local ordinances and how this is going to be enforced. We, however, believe very strongly that a pharmacy is, um, there's a pharmacist that oversees a pharmacy and what they're there, the patients are there to get pharmaceutical care first and foremost. And these patients deserve to get appropriate care. Um, we added some language regarding the pharmacist in charge and that's in 1776 um, point, 1776 INJ. So if you turn to page three of the regulations, um, and this was language that was actually recommended by CPHA, and we've discussed it briefly at the January board meeting as well. And what it states that a pharmacy shall not provide take-back services to consumer as provided in section 1776 to 1776.4 if in the professional judgment of the pharmacist in charge, who is the individual that is responsible for operations in that pharmacy, the pharmacy cannot comply with the provisions of the article or the DEA rules. So there could be a lot of reasons for that. They don't have the space. They have had a lot of thefts in their area. They are in an area where the pharmacy cannot really host a receptacle. So that is in there as well. And, and I, we also included a pharmacy shall not provide take back services to consumers if the pharmacy or the pharmacist in charge is on probation with the board. We believe that the pharmacy should have a clear license before they um, are participate. And if the pharmacy had previous, previously provided take-back services, the pharmacist in charge shall notify the board and the DA as required in subsections H and I above. That was another thing. The other thing we added was 1776.3A, where we refer to um, the receptacle security after closure. So if a pharmacy is closed, and there is no way for the receptacle to be, it has to be locked, it's not, we do not, we feel very strongly that um, at least Debbie and I did in our discussions, 
and we're recommending to the board members, we do not want people just tossing off bags of pharmaceuticals and laying it at the foot of the receptacle because that prevents a safety hazard for other locations. We all know what happens with trash cans when the trash gets full. And there are, some of these pharmacies are in locations where there could be kids, it could be in a grocery store, um, very concerned about the security and of other individuals that are around that. So um, that, we also put that in there as well. Um, I don't know, Debbie, besides that, those are the primary changes that we made in, the, in our recommend, and this is after careful review of all the comments that we received to make sure. I have yeah. a couple of questions, but I have a remark. Okay, yes. so I wasn't writing fast enough. So the professional judgment phrase, of course, is the thing that's of most interest now. So what, what does that mean? So you had not enough space, and there was a couple others you mentioned as, as you were speaking. I didn't get a chance to know. There them. could be, there could, uh, Stan mentioned there's a pharmacy, what, they've got four thefts in a, in, maybe they're in a location where they believe that there may be an issue with um, thefts if they ha if they host a receptacle. And it, this is not referring to the envelopes. The other thing we did. Well, I was going to ask about the envelopes no, too. No, no, no. We pared down well, okay. the envelopes because there is no, Jenny clarified to us that there is no reason for a pharmacy to have to document the envelopes. As they provide them. So that's all been stricken from the right. Well, then also I was thinking how professional judgment as it relates to distributing envelopes. I don't know how there could be an objection to handing an envelope to somebody. There wouldn't be, because anybody right. can hand an envelope. It doesn't so, even have to be done in a pharmacy. Right. So, so yeah, okay, so the envelopes are, okay, off the table, or to the kiosk. Mm -hmm. And then the kiosk issues would be, okay, it's not enough space, right. uh, likelihood of theft in the neighborhood, and you mentioned a couple of them. Ramon, it could be the pharmacist in charge is legally responsible for maintaining regulations in that pharmacy. Right. We're holding him responsible for a number of things. And they should have, we, I believe they should have the distinction to determine whether they can safely provide, whether they can protect public health and safety in that pharmacy, given the, all the other things that are around that pharmacy. Right. No, I, I understand the general concept. I was trying to get specific as to what we think that means. And we think that means a pharmacist might say there's not enough space in here, or a pharmacist might say there's a likelihood of theft. Well, <coughs> you can't secure the receptacle. So space kind of goes with securing the receptacle because we have to be able to secure the receptacle. So both like when the pharmacy's closed, you have to be able to put it, you know, it, it, you, these things can't move. You know, right. They're, they're bolted down. So you have to have it in such a way that when the pharmacy's closed and maybe the rest of the store's open, that, you know, that there's not access to it because we don't want people piling, you know, returns on Right. On okay, time. I understand. So yeah, I think that's that, very helpful. Just can't secure receptacles, sort of summarizes. And, and you to have to be, you know, we also want, um, you know, line sight of it. So if you're in a pharmacy, you're, and the only open space is like across the building, um, you know, in front of another bunker, you know, so, it, so the, the space thing, I think, is a, is a huge concern. We don't want it to take up the whole waiting area, so then the consumer doesn't have any place to sit, because sometimes consumers need to be able to, you know, just sit down. Right. No, I hear you. Okay. Okay. So the, the, who's ever throwing screens up behind you is not helping you because they're showing one in a crowded pharmacy stuck in a corner there uh, where it's not obviously evidently a big space problem. But, um, okay, so that's, I, I get you. So we're talking about, and, and, and I guess the other thing is this doesn't sound like it would be a blanket policy. Say one chain couldn't just say, we have this problem in every single facility. There's not enough space or, you know, you can't secure receptacles. One chain couldn't have the same PIC. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to get down to. So we're down to the level of the individual drugstore now as to where this objection could possibly be raised. To, to the pharmacist that's responsible right. for so maintaining regulations. Right. So if we're in San Luis Obispo County, it couldn't just be one chain. <laughs> okay. All our stores in the whole county are, you know, the professional judgment. Uh, off off limits. Uh, it would have to be on a store by store basis. But but they could still do mail back. Right. No, I understand they could still do mail back. So but I'm just trying to to, to, to narrow the, the impact of this professional judgment to where what we're talking about is individual pharmacies. This could not be a blanket right. statement that yes. that a whole chain could make for all of its pharmacies in a county or something. This would have to. You'd have to have a story for each one of your drugstores as to why it wouldn't work here. Yes, and I think Stan had a comment. Well, it's a question actually probably of Debbie because you've got experience with this, Debbie. Um, blocking, physically block, uh, the, um, the pharmacy shall lock the deposit slot on the collection receptacle and physically block the public from access to the collection receptacle by some means. <coughs> I'm in favor of this. But, uh, but, I'm so, 
from time to time, I'm in Vons. And, um, and so Vons has a prescription counter and a small waiting room or where they do injections or something. And then there is the store in the different aisles where they have the, the dry goods. So at the end of the day with Vons, they, they have a, a metal uh, gate that comes down, not quite to the counter, but to that little area above the counter. Mm -hmm. And so if they have a receptacle someplace outside, there's no way they can block that. Yeah, I would agree that by the, um, the language that we proposed, that, that that would be a that would be a challenge. Yeah. And, and could they believe, could they put like a screen? It underscores the challenge that these create. Well, uh, and, and I would say also a lot of times and and you know in a lot of stores it seems like there's a screen that <coughs> comes around. Right. So I think that there are there are stores models, where it comes around. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's stores where it just comes down and it just blocks off just the pharmacy yeah. area, not the waiting area. Um, and then there's stores, you know, where it, it yeah. comes from. And, and this just could be the bombs that I go to, you know, at a, a specific spot. Right. But, but anyway, so I'm I mean, I think, Stan, our, our concern is, honestly, we don't, you know, you, you know how we just don't want people to come in and say, oh, darn it, the pharmacy's closed. I'll just leave it here. I'll just put my bag on top. Yeah. Oh, no, because you, we've locked the thing down, so you can't put anything in. And that's human nature. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So we... we can't you know so we're, we're trying to prevent yeah. you know uh, because that could be even a bigger consumer pr I mean, it could be we, awful we here we're trying to you know solve a problem and we're going to potentially create an even bigger problem so i think that's why we you know we kind of feel like the the receptacle needs to be yeah. Yeah. off limits when the pharmacy that's in, responsible for it is not in business especially since you want line eye view by a pharmacist yeah. And, but it's got to be a reachable by the patient, mm -hmm. so yeah, which means it can't I'm be good. behind the counter of right. the pharmacy. No. no. So if it's in a pharmacy that closes, then they have no problem. They can just yeah, they close their right. door. But, but they're I would okay. say most of the retail stores, the pharmacy has shorter hours than the balance of the store. Right. Yeah. So like the grocery store situation. And the retail drug stores, most of the time, quite often the pharmacy has the pharmacy might be open like. Nine to nine, and the balance of the store is open eight to ten. <coughs> so I know Walgreens decided to do some of this. Is what I read in the news, and yes. they are limiting it to their twenty-four hour stores. Is what I understand. Well, that's probably. I, I haven't read. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't are. pick that up. Yeah, if it, I don't know if anyone's here from Walgreens. We, but my some, we, yeah. got, we got. A I don't know if they're willing. Room full. I don't know if they're no, interested no. in speaking. Uh -huh. My understanding was, and I'm guessing it's because the of the access Chicago. issue. Uh oh, Dennis has put his jacket back on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the Walgreens way. Oh. <laughs> That's a Walgreens. Yeah, yeah, is that a CVS remark? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're, if, let's just make it clear. If we're going to public comment, we're doing that, okay? Because there's a lot of people here who want to comment. I, I think I just asked a question specifically. We just mentioned Walgreens, and he's just going to say whether our is it the 24-hour stores? Are uh, good morning, uh, Dan Lewis, National Director of Pharmacy Affairs with Walgreens, and glad to answer your questions. Um, we're predominantly doing these in 24 hours, but it's not exclusive to the 24 hours. There'll be some sites where we've got no 24-hour presence in a community. We want to put one in, so we may have to go without a 24-hour store, but predominantly that's where they're going to be. Thank you. Okay, so uh, any other board comments before we open it up to the public comments? And perhaps we could start out with those that have flights that have to leave. Uh, would you like a motion before? Uh, yes, if you... I'll make a motion that we approve it as, as presented. For 15-day comment? For 15-day For 15 day comment? Day. Yeah, I'll second. Her. Second from Greg. Um, I have a question then. Yes. Now, um, besides the professional judgment of the pharmacist in charge, now how about the uh, per personnel matters of the pharmacy? Now, you need the receptacle, receptacle to be opened by two employees. But what if I run a pharmacy, only got one pharmacist and one employee? I would never have two employees. So. 
then you'd have to have the pharmacist would do I it. fall into the category that I choose not to participate because I don't even have the personnel to do it not but if just you because have, of this you space. have a pharmacist and an employee that's the yeah two. just that's one two just people. two people yeah but oh, you need to have two employees to open it so do we need to change it so you're saying the you're you're assuming that the one of the people can't be the owner yeah do you so have no, one that's not our intent that's not our intent the owner can yeah. The, the owner the could be. The owner may yeah. or may not be um, a licensed individual. Well, we, we might want to get some public comment because those two keys you see right there, one is for the person who's picking up the drugs, and the other is for somebody who works in the drugstore, as I understand it. So the second person may not be working for the drugstore at all. Well, this, it, when these were set up, they were model guidelines, and one was the key uh, that the pharmacy had. The other was the waste hauler that was right, to, exactly. to remove stuff, right. and that was a double check. This right. is no longer part of the DEA model. There is no longer a double lock on the on the container. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to hear some public comment because this is obviously going to be, you know, complicated. So, how many people here have have a flight issue for that needs to testify? How many have one there? Anyone else? Okay. So we have one person that has a flight problem. And, and my second question is, if it is not voluntary, that means the pharmacy will have to do either one. You can either do the, the mailbag or the receptacle. You have to do both. You have to do either one. Well, I think we're silent on it. We're, we're silent. silent. We're not we saying mandatory. We don't say mandatory. Right. Okay. We're not saying mandatory. We're not, not, we didn't replace volunteer with mandatory. Right. Yeah, it did okay. go on again. Okay, did you want to come and comment since you've got a flight? Thank you so much. My name is Jen Jackson. I'm with the San Francisco Department of the Environment. And I first just want to thank all of you for addressing this issue and continuing to take so much public comment. And I really appreciate the attention to detail because this is a very complicated issue. And I know you take up lots of complicated issues, which we've been hearing this morning. So the first, first of all, you have reflected many of the comments that many of our colleagues and we have made, so thank you for that in this new draft. And there are still a few things that we have concerns about. So first, there are a few places in these regs that overreach the DEA regs, and I know that your intention is to make things clear so that there aren't multiple layers and confusion. We all want pharmacists who want to be able to participate to be able to participate, so we don't want it to be more confusing, but it, these are places where we think there is some confusion. So for example, there's this list of prohibited items. So DEA never mentions anything can, can about- Can you draw us to the point on the document? Sure, so it's in, in the very first, uh, second paragraph of the first page. As it's also listed again under 1776-1 item I, I believe. But it's right there on the first page. So the list this is of- the second paragraph of the, of the first 1776. Yes, so it's it talks about medical sharps, needles, iodine containing medications, mercury containing thermometers, blah, 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 blah. So all of those items, DEA never mentions anything about what may be placed into a receptacle. And we ask that you remove this language. There are a couple reasons why. So first of all, epinephrine, EpiPens, they're in a sharp and very, very often quite often actually, they are never used. So there's medication left in those sharps and we want those to go somewhere. Those are controlled substances. They, have, they are dangerous if they're used and we want them to go into a place where someone can't access them. Ep you're talking about epinephrine? EpiPens. It's not a controlled it's a, substance. It's a four. So I'm not sure how that lands. I don't believe no. so. Okay, on the DEA list it is. So, um, but in any case, they are dangerous. And so we really do want those to be out of people's homes once they've expired there needs to be a place for those to go. So, and, and then, in addition, because this is a SHARP, it's overreach of the, the Medical Waste Management Act because it does say in the in Health and Safety Code that SHARPs and medication can be commingled if both of them are going for incineration. So, like so you sh can't put those in pharmaceutical receptacles, the SHARPs? They can be commingled as long as they're going to a place that it's going to be incinerated. So if you're only autoclaving, you cannot put medication in but if you're going to incineration, then both of those can be commingled. That's under federal law or state law? That's health and safety code, and I could get you the reference okay. for that. I don't have okay. it here on me. Thank you. Um, and then another example of a problem product that's on this list is chemotherapy agents. So my mother passed away three years ago. She was 
she had a mail-in prescription that she received from the manufacturer of a chemotherapeutic agent. It made her so sick that she could not take it anymore. So after she passed away, we collected all these drugs. So those are something that we would want to get rid of properly. We don't want those to go to landfill. What we're saying here in this case is then that we're asking caregivers to separate drugs out. And I don't think any of us wants that. We don't want these to go to landfill. And we certainly don't want them to be diverted and go to pill parties and teenagers get into them. These are dangerous drugs too, and they should actually go into the bin. Um, last but not least, in terms of that overreach question, and I appreciate whoever brought it up about this physical barrier and blocking the bins. So as you see in our photo of my, my, one of my bins in San Francisco, uh, there is this lockable chute at the top, and this is exactly what the DEA asked for, that there be a lockable chute so that people can't stick their hands in. But requiring an additional barrier around this bin somehow goes to someone's point here where some of these pharmacies only have a roll-up door at the counter. They don't have a door around the waiting room. And so if we're asking for there to be some kind of barrier, there's no specificity as to what that barrier looks like. So it's a sort of more confusion for a pharmacist. How am I supposed to comply? And so they may just say, I'm not going to do it at all because I can't comply with this very vague instruction of having a physical barrier. So we ask that you, you strike that and just stay with the DEA regs. The can, DEA can regs you just point out where through. that is in, in our proposed regulation? I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. 1776.3a. Thank you. I know these very well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, then I'd love to just go to the issue around preemption. So I appreciate um, preemption. So I appreciate that you all have removed the, the language around voluntary. And that's great because it could have been construed as the Board of Pharmacy preempting local law. But now the new language, I think, can be construed as a pharmacist preempting local law. So I think there needs to be a lot more specificity as to what, in what circumstances professional judgment can be used. And I very much appreciate the issue of professional judgment. In my line of work in environmental compliance, we use professional judgment all the time. And so I understand that a pharmacist is incredibly well trained, they know their jobs well, and in any scenario where I am w working with a pharmacist, I would want to make sure it's a safe situation as well. So I think this is really a collaboration. It's not local jurisdictions trying to shove this down someone's throat and it being unsafe. No none of us would want that. But I think by adding this language, this, this piece about professional judgment and without that clarification as to when they can make that decision. So if it's unsafe, yes. If they, obviously if they're not in compliance with other things and they have some kind of board action against them, sure. But there are a lot of places where they might just not want to. And I think that, that that's not really warranted. Um, there, so are, the there are certain situations where we really need to have these programs in place and I think you need to leave some of some of this more open to local jurisdictions. So the only time this would happen was if there was a local ordinance that required it. Otherwise, this wouldn't acceptable. even come in, into place. But well, if the it, local ordinance required someone to maintain a receptacle, that so would be the only time this would really be an issue. Potentially. So in our in our situation in San Francisco, we've required that there be 55 locations, five locations per supervisory district. In order for us to get there, we are going to need to have receptacles in some neighborhoods that might be considered threatening or scary. Mm -hmm. And honestly, there's so much more valuable stuff behind that counter than what's going into this bin. We've been doing these drug take back programs now for four years. We've had no incidents, none. And so I really, I feel like there's gonna be a lot more fear of doing this than there needs to be. We've been doing it really safely and I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that a pharmac pharmacist will say I don't wanna do that because I don't know if I can comply. And the word can or cannot is very vague. So if there is a situation where there is a mandatory ordinance that they have to do it, the pharmacist could give out envelopes as an option, or they could explain to the local ordinance why they believe this certain regulation they can't comply. And couldn't you deal with it at the local level? So they could say, well, I don't want to do it because of this, this, and this. I've had three thefts in the last year. I'm very concerned about the safety. And that couldn't that be dealt with at the local level? I guess what I'm saying is in this particular piece, you need to say what it is. So if you maybe add the word safely and then add some specifics as to 
what their professional judgment encompasses in this particular scenario. I so the, before, the, you, the, before you add anything, we depend on pharmacists' professional judgment all the time. Absolutely. And, you know, is this on yet? And we, uh, we expect them to make good professional judgment in life and death situations. Mm -hmm. I, I would wonder what they would feel if we decided to be specific on what their professional judgment should be. I think also that I'm trying to add words to describe all the possible scenarios. Um, I, I think we're, it, it, you're kind of going down a rat hole. Yeah. Well, if we add the word safely, that might capture. It's, if someone says, I cannot comply with the DEA regs, we need to know why. But so they're already complying with many other DEA regulations. Would that be something safe? you would ask them, though? If it was a local ordinance, you would ask them, as uh, San Francisco, say, why can't you? And then couldn't you review that at the local level? Absolutely. But if they decide that they're not going to do it because they think their reasoning is better than ours, I suppose we would have to go down the another rat hole of compliance, administrative fines, and penalties because they're not complying. But, it, but safety is only kind of one of the pieces. You know, it's also, you know, it's, it's the control of the, of, the, of the receptacle. And I think as Dr. Gutierrez pointed out, let's say San Francisco mandates, well, the pharmacy would have a couple options. I mean, the, the receptacle isn't the only option. Right, that's the true. The other option is the mail. So the pharmacy would say, okay, I have two options. Gosh, the receptacle is not going to work in my pharmacy, so I'm going to provide the mail envelopes. But So we're not denying anybody coming into a store the ability to dispose of their medications. We're just trying to give their options that is the best solution for that location. I guess and we not get in, be over prescriptive. I guess we get into the issue of conflicting professional judgment. So <laughs> that's that's the concern. Is that at the local level we may have make a different well, judgment. judgment between I, I do an envelope. I mean, either way you mandate it, I gotta do something. So you're saying that there's a professional judgment between an envelope or a receptacle. Either way the patient has an opportunity, they're still gonna be able to you know, have their drugs taken back. They're, they're still going to have drugs taken back, just whether it's in an envelope or a receptacle. So, I mean, if it's mandated, it's mandated. Could, could I ask a couple of questions just, you know, to yeah. take this out further? Uh, well, one thing is if you can definitely mandate envelopes, and envelopes are expensive, uh, then it might be a way to basically get the drugstore to think hard about a kiosk. Okay. Only if you mandate that the pharmacy pays for the envelope. I mean, they could Well, they could. It, they, I mean, well, the consumer could pay the postage, too. Right, I know, but I'm just saying the city or county could. That's in their jurisdiction. And to mandate that, uh, you know, the drugstore give out envelopes. That might be part of their decision, then. Right, so, exactly. So I'm saying that could then, it becomes a cost thing. But then just to uh, pass on that uh, to more directly, okay, so we come up with a hypothetical situation where a county mandates a kiosk and a pharmacist says, oh, no, I can't do this in my professional judgment. And then the county says, well, how do you figure that? And the pharmacist says, well, I don't like the color of the kiosk or something. And say, well, that's not a good enough reason, you know. And so we become involved in a dispute. So then you try and fine. And then they try and defend based on the, well, they've got their badge of pharmacist and you can't touch them. And so how does this then play out once the conflict is constructed? Uh, you know, I don't mean to be, you know, flip saying you don't like the, the color, but, you know, the, 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 what I want to understand is, okay, so now this conflict starts to unroll. And so we've got a pharmacist saying, I've got professional judgment. We've got a city saying, that's bullshit. Uh, you know, you should be, you know, having, that's, that's not a good reason. Uh, so what, then what happens? I guess you wind up in court and some judge has to decide which, which trumps, the professional judgment or, you know, and then the judge is asked, is that really professional judgment? You don't like the color? Uh, and, and so I, if you could roll out for me a little bit, what, what, how would this end play if, if... You know, Ramon, can I just... Well, yeah, let's, let's ask... There's a little bit here, though, that I'm actually offended. That, you know, you're, you've sat on this board for eight years. Most of it, we've been here together. Yeah. And really, you think so little of the pharmacists that you think that their professional judgment 
would be, I don't like the color of the receptacle. I well, mean, we can make up know, another spurious judgment. or objectionable or questionable one, okay? It doesn't really matter. The point is, is when we well, get to the conflict, it how does, does it, it resolve? Does, I think it, it does, does matter. I think it, it does, does matter. All right, I take it back, all right? Now can I get my question answered? How does the conflict resolve when there's a dispute between the county or the city and the pharmacist, okay? Well, I think that question should be referred. At Laura or Desiree, do we have any, in terms of a legal, this well, is a legal can issue. Can I ask our witness, please? I have a question. I, I'd like an I answer. Can't answer. I don't I think she could answer. Don't I think this becomes a legal issue. Well, then, issue. counsel, could you try and answer it? Um, so, I think you know, with any question of professional judgment, the the next question is, what does this board do about that? And if if a pharmacist did exercise professional judgment in a way that that the board considered unprofessional, then it would file an accusation, issue a citation, and it would go through all the regular review processes. Well, what, what if the city considered it unprofessional? That, that's between the city and the pharmacist. Well, okay, that's, not, I mean, that's not, the, the board would have no role in that. So the city could say, that's not a good reason. We think you should have this thing here. And then this is what would go to a judge and he'd have to sort it out, or she'd that, have to sort it I out. I assume that the city would have to take some sort of enforcement action mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to enforce it and then the and question then is there what would be a factual determination by the judge a judge some some type of judge maybe an administrative maybe a superior court judge right again i guess i'm trying to make it so that pharmacists can participate and they will want to and so leaving it to this gray area and not really sure what it means to that one cannot participate in this um, I feel like it, it causes more confusion. So you're but stating that the, a pharmacist's professional judgment is unclear. The way the regs, or way, the, way the way this reads right now, it says, pharmacist in, uh, if in the professional judgment of the pharmacist in, pharmacist in charge, the pharmacy cannot comply with the provisions of this article or the DEA rules. So the cannot comply part, cannot is very open to judgment. And so that's, I, I think the whole purpose, or the, the point of you creating these regs as opposed to just doing some adoption mirroring the DEA regs was to avoid some of that confusion in the gray area. So I'm pointing out here that this might confuse pharmacists. Can I just ask, um, so you're kind of focusing in on that cannot comply, the pharmacy cannot comply. Let's say they don't have any room for it. So, well, let me, let me ask my question first. So what would be a stronger way of saying the pharmacy cannot comply, or a clearer way of saying they cannot comply? Mm -hmm. What recommendation, what yeah. recommended language Well, I just have? got this last okay. night, so <laughs> I will say that we've been really, working really hard to keep up with y'all. Yeah. Um, but this just came out last night, and I would say that something around safely, or I would actually, honestly, I would, I would prefer that you strike I, this, this section I. I think that what I've heard here is there's, uh, I've hear, heard in this room among some of the pharmacists here that there's a lot of fear. I heard one of, them, one of the board members say, I wouldn't want to have one of those bins in my pharmacy. And I think it's because there's a lot of fear and not sure about what this is going to look like. But this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. And it's, it's not a scary thing to do this. And many pharmacists are doing it already because they want to provide this service. And so, I think that having this additional language here unfortunately gives an out for some of the chains for, that have not really been playing ball, honestly. Some chains have not been wanting to participate in any of these programs. We have 12 independent pharmacies, some of which have less than 1,000 square feet. They're tiny, and they're providing space. They can do it. Almost so, anybody so can this, do this. this. A chain cannot utilize this. It has to be the individual pharmacist that's at that location who is then this pharmacist but is the responsible for ensuring for all the regulations are maintained. It's the one that'll get cited or fined on their professional license whenever something occurs in that pharmacy. That's the pharmacist that we're asking to use their professional judgment like they do with anything else in pharmacy operations, not the chain store owner. I just want to clar clarify that. That's helpful. Um, I'm not sure how that relationship between the pharmacist and the owner of the store, whether it's a retail chain or the owner, some independent owner, I don't know how that works. So well, if it you works can in a variety that. of ways. It's professional. It's ethical. We just spoke about uh, the right to die, where a pharmacist would be able to go to his or her employer 
and cite it ethically or religiously. I can't do this. We've talked about uh, uh, contraceptives, where pharmacists will be able to go to their employers and say, ethically, morally, I can't, I can't do this. I mean, we either accept the professionals as professionals, or we don't. And we, again, we uh, we expect them to make proper decisions, life or death. And in other decisions as well, we expect we expect the same level of quality in the decision making. If that doesn't happen, there are consequences. I, you know, I really and truly feel that we're all here to protect the public. <clears throat> but I'm here agree. because of my experience as well, mm -hmm. and I am a pharmacist, and I did own a bunch of pharmacies, and I did own pharmacies that were less than a thousand square feet. They were all in medical buildings. Most of them were, not all. 25 maybe in medical buildings and I'm sure you've passed by pharmacies similar to that so that's my experience 500 square feet 400 square feet a thousand square feet and I've got to tell you it would be very very difficult to find a, a spot in a small pharmacy number one I mean I think it's great if the larger pharmacies I had that was fine but there are certain locations and certain situations which just make it difficult to comply and and so you, do mail. so you do mail so i mean and you have relationships with your customers it's not like it's a turnstile with people coming and going so i mean i i'd like to depend on the professional judgment of pharmacists more than i guess otherwise others would All right stan if i may just point out i've been in a pharmacy that i don't think had a uh, open space larger than what's right here in front of us between these tables, and they had the kiosk in there. That's great. So that's it great. Could be done. If they, well, I'm, it's, it's some, some, some can't, but, but the, but the point is right. that it ought to be left at the option of the pharmacist in charge of this, of this 900 square foot shop on whether or not there is room or there, it safely can be placed there. And so that's just, this very same pharmacy got broken into repeatedly. And as I said earlier, two minutes they were in and out. So, so there's a, it, it isn't you know just a cookie cutter situation. I'm, I'm we sorry. agree. We agree with you on that. Every pharmacy is different, and we certainly work with all of our pharmacies that are in our pilot program, who have gone above and beyond, have put themselves out there, because there have been no real regulations to support them to do this. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Thank you. I wanted to pull pull one more piece out. So there is sort of this this issue around medical waste. So medical waste is a determination here in California and things like the US Department of Transportation doesn't necessarily Can you again have just point, point us to where we are looking? Sure. Um, so we are on 1776.3H. So in this sec subsection there's a Sentence here, all rigid containers must meet standards of the U.S. Department of Transportation for transport of medical waste. So, so the Medical Waste Management Act and the Health and Safety Code of California do not deem home-generated pharmaceuticals as medical waste. And so this could cause some problems. Um, having this deemed as medical waste in your rules versus what's in the Health and Safety Code um, could cause problems, and the Department of Transportation may not necessarily recognize California's medical waste. So I think removal of just, mm -hmm. you know, of this, you could say of home generated pharmaceuticals or mm -hmm. some other wording there, but deeming it medical waste is problematic. Mm -hmm. So if we remove medical waste um, and just left it meet the standards of the United mm -hmm. States Department of Transportation, that would place on the common carrier or the reverse distributor the requirement that they have appropriate safeguards in whatever they're transporting that it would comply with the requirements because I will tell you that there is some confusion on this very point mm -hmm. about what the federal DOT is requiring for this to the point they're issuing waiver licenses versus what other vendors think that the law says and DOT hasn't given us anything in writing although we've requested it right I know <laughs> we have to so yeah. I, yes I think removal of just that last clause for transport of medical waste would make this more Again, clear where is that in here that you're referring to uh, 1776 it's on page oh, 5 page um, 5 in the middle, right in the middle. And, I, and I get to point out that you have, you had a regulation here yeah. about color so 
you know, evidently, evidently it does matter what color it is. Well, at one, yeah, actually, but that's because waste is, is a color at 50 feet. You can tell, oh, that's biomedical waste, that's hazardous waste, that's whatever other kind of waste you can have out there. Right. So, and then on the matter. bottom of page seven, it's the same problem. Um, the very last sentence there for transport of medical waste, so we just need to delete that there as well. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, Thank wait, you. Don't go. I've got a non controversial question. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be more. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it first. Yeah. Yeah. Hear it first. No, you know, uh, on your first point, which uh, I agree with you, it's nice to throw everything in the box. But, you know, aren't those P and U, uh, it's been a while since I've been in that, but don't, aren't those drugs that can't be mixed? Aren't, like in a pharmacy, don't we have to separate those out into a separate container? The RICRA waste? waste. So home-generated pharmaceuticals do not fall into hazardous waste or medical waste at this point. Oh, isn't so that interesting? No, see, okay. I would agree with you that we should not be throwing mercury thermometers in these bins. Okay. In our bins, um, this is not ours, okay, but the point of generation ours does have so. that kind of information, yes. Okay. So it affects the environment less when it's medical rather than industrial waste. It depends on where it's going for incineration. There, there are different levels of heat and different incinerators. That's good to know. So good question, Alan. Oh, thank you. But for example, in our bin, we do say no, no, um, no mercury thermometers because we don't want that to go into incineration because mercury right. will get airborne then. So there are certain things that we would agree with, but the cytotoxic drugs, chemo drugs, sharps, we think that's problematic. And the schedule one's the DA requirement. Right. Okay. So, so thank you. So, we, so, I really appreciate right. your so time. In short, thank just you to, for letting me come early because I have just, to leave. Just to understand your comments. And so the concerns I heard, or I'm remembering right off the top of my head now, uh, are the word safely. Uh, regarding professional judgment, uh, and I do think actually agree with Stan again uh, that I think professional judgment does imply that. Uh, but uh, then the other issues are uh, medical waste, and then also uh, excluding sharps uh, as a sharps and, chemotherapy and agents, chemotherapy iodine agents. drugs, all of those drugs. Okay, all right. So uh, I may be looking to try an amendment out to at least to deal with the sharps chemical waste issue. Uh, chem chemotherapy issue and medical waste. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, given, does anyone else have a flight? Otherwise, we'll do a lunch break for 30 minutes. Okay. Get okay. back on. Thank we'll you. be back at 1.30. Thank you. Pharmaceutical take back regulations. If you can come up one at a time. Okay, come on up. You can both come. Oh, no, I meant one at a time because there were some behind that raised their hand. Yeah, you both can come up together. Yes. Yeah, we are. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we are with the California Alliance for Retired Americans. It's a group that encompasses about 900,000 members, including uh, union members and community groups. And uh, we're here to talk about the drug take back program. This program is uh, for seniors, and we're retired Americans, uh, is an incredibly important effort. Uh, show, recent statistics show that people over 60 years of age account for about half of all the drugs prescribed in California. And for Los Angeles County, where I'm from, we have about 40% of all the prescriptions written in the state are written in Los Angeles County. So this is an issue that's very important to us, and we need to get the drugs out of the homes when they're no longer needed to avoid medication errors and uh, children getting a hold of the drugs. We, uh, we appreciate that the Board of Pharmacy is interested in this issue and is writing these uh, regulations, but we're concerned about how it affects other county regulations that have already been passed and specifically the regulation in Los Angeles County with the Board of Supervisors. And I have testified before the Board of Supervisors myself regarding the Drug Tick Act program. So I'd like to ask the question of the Board, how does this affect the county regulations that have already been passed and the one that the LA County Board of Supervisors are considering on May 3rd, as I understand it, they're going to be voting. So as a question for the Board. Well, I could 
give you a response on the LA County one. I actually, in my, I wear a second hat, and I'm the pharmacy director for the LA County Department of Health Services, and I'm part of the workforce that's working on the ordinance. The ordinance hasn't yet been passed in LA County, and that's the direction great. that's taking is the ordinance specifically states that all vol all participation from pharmacy shall be voluntary. So that is in the ordinance right now. So it is. There's nothing in here that's going to um, to really impact. The, it's just going to provide some direction for the pharmacies that elect to do it in LA County. So you're talking, saying these, this ordinance is voluntary, but the one from the LA County is passing is requiring that, that no. drug. No. no, the LA County ordinance is voluntary participation by pharmacies. That's the one that's being considered. What this doesn't say anything about voluntary or mandatory. We're not including. We're saying that if you're going to do it, and that could be per your ordinance, your local ordinance. Where, wherever, whatever requirements you have. If you're going to do it, this is how you can do it. This must be a change because the one I saw required that the collection points be within two and a half miles of anybody uh, within the LA County yeah. that needed to take back regular uh, drugs. Is, is just, there some change? I just urge you to go back and review the latest copy of the ordinance. And that's so a local issue. That's not something we would be involved with here. I just know about it because I work for LA County. So does that mean that drug Pharmaceutical companies can refuse to participate, and there's nothing that either the LA County will require them to do, or this uh, well, the, pharmacy. Our ordinance has nothing to do with payment, who's going to participate, or any of that. Those are questions you probably need to refer back to the local county for LA County, and that probably I think that discussion's coming up on May 3rd. That's correct, May 3rd. Right, but uh, this is just saying if you are a pharmacy. And you elect to participate, or you want, or you want to do this for for any reason. This is how you do it. All right. I'm I'm just saying that the pharmacies, uh, drug companies, make it very convenient for you to buy your drugs. They'll have 24 hours, and yet they make it very inconvenient for you to take back the drugs. And you know, it's, it's something that my organization is very concerned about, and would like to, you know, foresee it uh, take place. And if and I would like to also uh, reiterate the last speaker about the fact that sharps are not included here. That we would would would, would prefer that sharps be we would like sharps be done. And of course the se question the section on neoplastic drugs and others that that are excluded. I mean that's a big gap. If you guys, pardon me, if the board uh, refuses to. Uh, include that in it, and I would urge you to uh, make changes in that. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Eva Goodwin Noriega, also from the California Alliance for Retired Re Americans. I'm actually a retired teacher, additionally. And I think then, I just want to confirm that my understanding of the previous discussion is that you will be amending this proposal to take out the phrasing on that second paragraph that makes it that you would only be taking back drugs. You are now going to leave that open, that it can be sharps that would be coming back in the bins also. Well, so sharps have their own <coughs> process, and sharps are not drugs. So, I, I mean, sometimes that. they're attached to drugs, but they're not right. drugs. So sharps take back is an entirely separate process. What we're referring to here is pharmaceuticals. I think the discussion that we just talked about was whether Medical. someone, let's say there was a needle with drug, there was some drugs in it, she was talking about EpiPens, yeah. and there was a sharp with it, could that be um, could that be removed so that the EpiPens could be tossed into the pharmaceutical receptacle? That was just a request that came from the previous speaker. The board hasn't taken a position on that yet. So. I, I do intend to make a motion to that effect. We'll see what happens. But, There's already uh, a motion on the floor. Right. <laughs> amend it then uh, well, I, to uh, address the issue of the sharps. What I understood from the way the woman from the environmental justice be, uh, group spoke, that she was proposing that you basically stop the sentence mm -hmm. in that second paragraph Right after in pharmaceutical tape back receptacles. She right, proposed. she was proposed. So our, our so you will now decide whether you're going to propose. Yeah, that this or is not. okay. Our the process today is we issued a draft which was yeah. circulated. We're just taking public no, comment on on suggestions to modify that draft. Right. Then the board will take action. Yeah. If let's say today the board says yes, we want to move forward with the regulation, we will open it up for an additional. 15-day public yeah. comment period to collect any other requests that should come from people that may not be here 
in addition. The so reason, the, uh, ooh, wait, wait, let me say something here. Um, <clears throat> KPCC actually did a regadio program on this, was part of NPR News on April the, on the 22nd, and the visuals, we looked it up last night, actually showed that one of the biggest problems in the waste disposal is actually the sharps. It started out with the sharps and how dangerous it is for the workers. So then I became really concerned. And now I don't know the definition of sharps. The article, of course, is for the public consumption, was including medical sharps and any other kind of sharps. I don't think it included knives, but it was. So I would hope your intent would be to enable collection of all sharps or however you guys work that, easy collection of that. As I understand it, the LA County uh, ordinance that they were considering did include sharps. So would, if this is passed the way we see it, that would supersede what the LA County uh, passes if they continue no, LA, to pass? No, LA County, even if they did sharps, it doesn't, we're just dealing with the pharmacies. There is other people, there's no requirement from the DA that sharps have to be collected in a pharmacy. So there could, they could establish collection sites at community centers, at county halls. There could be other places that have nothing to do with the pharmacy. Our role is to govern pharmacy regulations. So the LA County, if they included Sharp's collection with, in pharmacies, the, that, would be ex, that would be denied if you pass this resolution the way we see it. I, I don't think so. I'm, well, that's a good question. I'll ask our legal counsel. You're counsel. saying no sharps, and what if they say sharps? Because this, the whole, the, this whole regulation is entitled prescription drug take back program. So it's about pharmaceuticals. Yeah. The only discussion about the sharps is if the pharmaceuticals happen to be attached to a sharps, yeah. like the EpiPen right. that she just described. Right. So I don't think we've, this is only about prescription drugs. You're mute on that particular but, issue then. But okay. as, I, as I reiterate, the LA County says yes, the pharmacies can take back sharps. You would deny it. I, I just request you to go back and review the ordinance because I don't believe there's anything specifically there that says pharmacies are going to do it. I think they are looking at increasing access all over. It doesn't, sharps are not drugs. They don't have to go back to a pharmacy. In fact, limiting it to pharmacy would be limiting access to the public. You'd want to have it at more locations. Why would you restrict yourself to that? and compressed cylinders or aerosols may not be deposited into the receptacle. Right. The, reg? Your reg. Yeah. yeah. And that's what they're recommending in the other speakers that we review that. They're recommending that. to take that out. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm saying. Right now, it's you, in there. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I understand. I want to know what Laura has to say. So um, my thought on that is that this would prohibit the, sh the sharps from going in the collection receptacle. Right. as it's written now the in the take-back receptacle. Sharps. But that wouldn't necessarily prohibit the pharmacy from having a different container to collect right. sharps. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's how I understand yeah, you as well. Okay. Yeah. And, and just as a final comment, uh, this whole question of uh, drug take-back has been fought fiercely by the big pharma and the pharmaceutical industry. Even though it costs them one cent out of every $30, <laughs> for example, that they collect, they are really opposed to this, and anything that would confuse and delay a drug kickback program uh, should be opposed. And I'm a, I'm a little concerned that if this ordinance was passed, that somehow it would interfere with the LA <coughs> County ordinance, and they're and they're taking they're uh, uh, passing that ordinance by saying, oh, it's already been done by the Board of Pharmacy. We don't need to pass something in the LA <coughs> County. And I am. Uh, really uh, suspicious of, of this activity and, and the political fight around it. This is a political fight, not just a medical fight and a technical fight, but a political fight where, where Big Pharma doesn't want to spend money on this. And uh, I'm, I'm cautious about this. If, if you review the this. public comments that were posted on the website, you will see that LA County has provided comments to the regulations. They were also at our hearing that we held in Orange County um, earlier this month. So LA County has been actively participating from the, the individuals that are working on the ordinance in this, in these regulations, and they've provided comments. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I wanted to ask, since you're involved with the one with Los Angeles where you said it's going to be voluntary participation, 
um, is that is that because you want to make it really easy in our, for them to go whichever direction and you, Amy, who are, in fact, of L.A., are you envisioning that more pharmacies would be enthusiastic about it? Or well, that's a discussion we, we should probably have at the L.A. County okay, level. hearing okay. at the L.A. County level because we're, here we're talking about state regulations and these regulations specifically. Any L.A. County issues should probably be directed back there. And, and there is nothing that would prevent any county from adopting their own drug take-back program. Which is that correct? This is saying that if a pharmacy is going to do it, this is how they would do it. These are the precautions they have to take, and they mirror what the DEA regulations state, with the exception of a few areas which we've had discussion already today. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Only only one page today. <laughs> you must be happy then. Yes. What size five? <laughs> Six. <laughs> Hi, I'm Thomas Hare. I'm um, speaking as a staff member for the city of Santa Rosa. And I, I just wanted to start off by, by thanking the board in general and Ginny in particular for being so responsive to some of our concerns that we've spoken about previously. Ginny's been very generous with her time, so thank you very much. Um, and, and, and thank you for some of the changes. That there really are significant improvements in this version. Um, there still are some concerns that we have that I was hoping to address. Um, as Jen man mentioned uh, in, on page three, 1776.1i, uh, it's a, it's a very, it's an interesting um, way of getting around the voluntary issue, and you've had a, a robust discussion of this already. Um, I just wanted to voice my opinion that I also am an environmental compliance inspector, and professional judgment is critical. And I expect people to trust mine, and I want to trust other people's as well. Um, but it is a little bit vague, the way that it's written. And again, I've just had this since last night as well. But with the possibility of inserting that word safely, so it read, if the pharmacy cannot safely comply, and it wouldn't be saying anything about the professional judgment, that's, that part stands, but just adding that one word might, or something like that, might make it more clear. But that, I'll leave it there. Next, um, on page four. Oh, yes, please. I guess my only worry with safety, safely or safety, is um, it has to be in the line of sight also? Yes. And so I'm not that kind. Of, so, so then we're kind of mincing words, and you know that's really not a safety issue. It's really more of you know you can't meet the um, the DA, provisions. The DA provisions. Yeah. I see. Yeah, so that's that, a good that's point. Why, that's why I'm safety or safely doesn't really. Work for, right, and that's that's actually a very good point. Maybe uh, maybe with another day, I could I could come up with another word. <laughs> but we let you have lunch before you came in, so you're supposed to be thinking well. Uh, but the the next one is 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 one of the largest concerns that I have, and I know that this is deeply held on on the part of Amy and Debbie, especially um, the physically block language, uh, 1776.3a, page four. What page are we on? I'm sorry. Page four. four. It's 1776.3a. Okay. You're talking about the last sentence. Yeah, the pharmacy shall lock the deposit, deposit slot on the collection receptacle and physically block the public from access to the collection receptacle by some means. Now, this is absolutely a legitimate concern. I'm not saying that it's not. But there, there are three points that I have about this concern. I actually don't think this concern can be solved, even though it's a legitimate concern. Uh, my first point is that members of the public already leave items on pharmacy counters. Already what? Leave items on pharmacy <laughs> counters. Even when there's no take-back program, has never been a take-back program, will never be a take-back program in that, in that location. That behavior is not going to change. Point number two, even if you install an accordion-style door or some other mechanism of physically blocking the bin, Anybody who would place an item on top of a locked bin is going to be just as likely to place that item next to right. the physical blockage. In which case, you're not accomplishing what the objective is. 
but you're making it, you're adding a barrier to implementation. So I think you're actually, even though that's not your intent, I think you're making it worse. And, and the third point is that this provision would make it significantly more difficult and therefore less likely for pharmacies and retail stores to participate, in my opinion, therefore likely shifting more of the burden to independent pharmacies, which I understand is a concern of the board. So I would like you to consider those three points when you think about the physical blockage. My, my next point is on page four as well, 1776.3b, uh, so not moving terribly far to this one. Uh, hoping for clarification, what does it mean to say that the collection receptacle must be within the pharmacy premise? Jenny, do you know what the answer to that is? No, I don't. I have is a, it I for ha the DA regs? Well, I it's think, not. I think that was yeah, us going it. back. I, I think the intent of that is it on the, like within the pharmacy building. Yeah. So my concern about that is that it's it not has very. It to be like in line of sight anyway. Yeah. So m my, my proposition would be to hybridize with the DEA language. In non-hospital -ho locations, the receptacle shall be installed in an inside location such that it can be seen from the pharmacy counter. Would that address your concern? Wait, I'm sorry. Say that, so it would if it said, instead of the within the pharmacy premise, if it said, in non-hospital locations, the receptacle shall be installed in an inside location such that it can be seen from the pharmacy counter. The hospital thing we can talk does, about separately. Does, uh, now, Jenny, does the DA have any regulations that have any requirements to that? Yeah, basically they want line of sight. But it could be anywhere? It could be anywhere. So really, with all due respect, yeah, no, I think um, striking out within the pharmacy premise takes you back to the... So can I place it on, if I'm a counter and I've got a window, can I put it on the outside? Of the window? No, no, no so outside of the pharmacy, outside <clears throat> of the pharmacy on the sidewalk. No. So no. I can see it. It's going to be inside. What he's suggesting is it's be installed in an inside location, location such that the receptacle is visible to the pharmacy. Right. Yeah, Destroy or what Ginny suggested would also Why accomplish my... Why can't I put it on the sidewalk if I'm watching it? Because, because um, it's, it's going to be inside the... Yeah, and, and, the, and the term pharmacy is defined in the code already as to be Sorry. inside <coughs> the licensed facility. Sorry. So it yeah. has to be on the pharmacy grounds. Yeah. So that within what it, we would consider part of the pharmacy license. Exactly. So I guess that answers that question. But I think you could take out the within the pharmacy premise. To the back to the way it was. Yeah, such that, I mean, what he suggested, such that inside locations, such that the receptacle is visible to the pharmacy employees. To but me, that, that would make it much more clear. Yeah, but getting to Desiree's comment, what if I put it in a place that's, I'm still visible, but it's not part of my pharmacy? Can it's I do be, that? No. Is it inside? Got to be inside the pharmacy. No, inside, but I'm yeah. in a grocery store and I put it. So some Way. retail pharmacies are 20,000 square feet, and yeah. you're saying, <coughs> from the pharmacy, I can see the, I, I can see pretty Where's far. The, the DEA regs, I believe, would allow that. And what's the definition of the inside. pharmacy address on the license? That's, that would govern. Yeah, and that's so what I think. The address is about 20,000 square feet. I think it would be what we would consider part of the pharmacy yes. license yep. area. The pharmacy license area, and that's 4037. So maybe we should, we should write that to, to comply with 4037. And so within the pharmacy as defined in 4037, mm -hmm. per definition of 4037. Yeah. And we can, well, I'll submit written comment on that as well for the 15 day. Are we ready to move to my next? You might want to give us just a minute. Absolutely. Let's give a minute, yeah, yeah let, let me, we're quite done yet. Let me look at 4037. <coughs> yeah, 4037, pharmacy means an area, place, or premises licensed by the board. Um, includes but is not limited to any area, place, or premises described in a license issued by the board or in controlled substance, dangerous drugs, or devices restored. That's the locked area. That is a, not what we want to use. Here. But are we required to do that? That's my no. question from the DEA. The DEA requires it to be on an inside location within the line eye view of the pharmacy. So it doesn't have to be in the pharmacy. No. I, I actually have the DEA reg right here. Um, it's on page 53569. Yeah. No, that's true. We don't have to do that. You're not my reference for and it okay. says, collection receptacles shall be securely placed and maintained inside a collector's registered location. And then it goes on to say, at a registered location, be located in the immediate proximity of a designated area where controlled substances are stored and at which an employee is present. And it specifies 
that can be seen from the pharmacy counter. But and then it goes on to accept a, hospitals. Isn't inside a collector's registered location the same thing as the pharmacy that we just described in 4037? No, the no. registered location is where you're taking back the drug that has to be registered with the DEA. The, the pharmacy itself <coughs> is, is, um, is licensed with the DEA, but the registrant for purposes of take back I think is a little broader because they were very clear that, they, that the patient has to put the drugs in him or herself. In a pharmacy licensed premise, no patient is allowed back there. Okay. In 4037 licensed area, it would only be the, the, the pharmacist or the authorized staff back there. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah. So it's just line staff, line view. Yeah. Except, so, except what you read is it's not, it's line of view and in immediate proximity. Yeah, but there's, um, it, it specifies, uh, can be seen from the pharmacy counter, and, and that, that is how they take care of that immediate proximity, and then it gets complicated because it goes on to exempt certain parts of hospitals. So that's why I did a hybrid language when I, when I proposed in non-hospital locations, the receptacle shall be installed in an inside location such that it can be seen from the pharmacy counter. But, but the non-hospital, or the hospital locations are addressed in C, so you don't have to worry about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But I think, Amy, to your point, you were saying you know, across the, the building, I guess what is our intent? We want it, like if, let's say you have a 15,000 square foot pharmacy, which is a large one, but do you want it? Do you want it next to the pharmacy or within the line of sight? Because it no, I'm fine be with line of sight. I just want to make sure whatever we clear, it's clear, whatever it we spell out. Well, you should just put up inside registered location. Well, well, registered yeah, location. but Ginny's yeah. saying the registered and, and location the is the bin, not the so, yeah. pharmacy. So, within the pharmacy premise, is that? something that we have decided is yeah, in most pharmacies coming go away. when you were yeah when you were discussing earlier your store you've got the licensed counter area that's restricted to people you've got barriers put up so right. the public doesn't get in there right. and for us to use 4037 we would be removing those barriers and allow yeah, the I mean, public so in. The pharmacy we don't want, we don't want that presence isn't, cons isn't considered the, the the area outside the Yes, it, that, yes. not, not for purposes of our verse. license. Okay. But, I don't, but I think it's duplicative. I don't think it's, it's, it's yeah. words that aren't offering any okay. clarification. Right. When a pharmacy registered with EA to have a receptacle, it is the registered location. It's where the receptacle is, yeah. That, right. could, be, that could be out from the pharmacy department. Right, it's right. right. But, if, but, but, but keep in mind, if the DEA comes in or if we come in and we don't think that there's any way on earth, we may kind of, you know, this doesn't really comply. But as long as it's actually is visible to the to the pharmacy. Yeah, exactly. Right yeah, I didn't I didn't wasn't aware it didn't have to be in the pharmacy. Oh yeah, yeah no, no, you don't want great. it. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to have a. Yeah. We've got great. enough drug diversity. That's more flexible. Without that. Could that be visible by mirror <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> video yeah. video camera? <laughs> yeah, video <laughs> camera. There you go. I mean, I, video it's not addressed in the DEA regs. They don't talk about visible from the from the from a camera. They just say line eye view pretty much and. So they say line of sight. It's just, it just it's says can be seen from vision. the pharmacy yeah. location. So seen could be a security camera. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good point. Here we go. <laughs> I actually like that. All right. It's interesting. So, so how did you get all that on one page? That's what I want. <laughs> you write He's small. not done yet either. Yeah. Well, it doesn't no, include your comments. I think it was a three Okay, moving on to line four. Okay. No. No. Uh, my next uh, item so to discuss was what uh, Jen had discussed about the medical waste. I liked what you guys had talked about just striking that, um, that language. So that, I'm sorry, page five, 1776.3H is the first place that it comes up. The all rigid containers must meet standards of the United States Department of Transportation for transport of medical waste. It was my understanding you were considering striking for transport of medical waste, which would alleviate my concern. Another possibility would be to say something like, uh, all drug disposal activities must be conducted in a manner consistent with this rule and all other applicable federal, state, tribal, and local laws and regulations. We've got that earlier in the reg somewhere. Yeah. I'm sure you do. You're, you're fully responsible for any law that's out there. You better know it. <laughs> I, I just would be very concerned to see medical waste there. I was actually on the phone with uh, one of the, um, well, with Jan Harris of Sharps, Inc. this morning, um, and her concern was that um, with the U.S. Department of Transportation, packaging regulations also include labeling regulations, and that you would likely have to put a biohazard label on the outside of a package, which then you couldn't use a common or contract carrier to transport. Oh, let's talk about the metal drum. <laughs> you have to transport it in. So, 
So if yeah, this, exactly. This will There's. This will get. Great. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I just wanted to um, ask for clarification at some point from the board about the authority uh, in prohibiting the dangerous drugs that was talked about by Jen. I, I just I'm not clear still where each of those items comes from. Um, this is found in multiple places in the reg. Uh, we were talking about it on page one. Um, that list of sharps and iodine and mercury and all of that. I just would really like to be able to look at the regs those come from. Why are you putting each of those items in? Because um, I'm still not sure about that. Um, also on page one, uh, my next concern is concerning the language uh, in the middle paragraph where it says collectors should be vigilant to prevent the public from disposing of. And I know that the DEA does also actually use that word vigilant at some point. Um, but my concern is that they, they use it in a different way than you're using it here. And you could prevent, uh, you could deter pharmacies from participating due to liability concerns. So I don't know if you would consider saying something like collectors, collectors should to the extent feasible be vigilant to protect or something like that, that that just gives a little bit of wiggle room. I would just be very nervous as a pharmacy. I'm not a pharmacy, obviously. Um, but I would be very nervous. Uh, what is my liability here? And so if you would consider, just consider that in the language. Um, as as in my, on my, last, my last comment um, is, is just that because there are so many people waiting on, on this to implement their programs, I, I really appreciate that you're trying to move through as quickly as possible. And so if you could just continue with that, that would be fabulous. And we'll work through changes as we need to. Thank you so much for your consideration. Okay, I, uh, on the last point you meant, uh, vigilant, yes, I'm, I mean, our council could answer this too. I mean, collectors should exercise due diligence. There's, there's some way to make it more consistent with what the expectations are of a professional, because it may be that the word vigilant does raise the bar um, unnecessarily. So I don't know what council thinks or what you think about that. Um, I, I actually have a note to bring that up to the board. My concern with it is that it is vague. It's not clear what you're expecting of the pharmacy. So that was a comment I was going to raise. So we just want to articulate what it is if it's in, um, consistent with professional standards or if you want to, um, you know, consistent with the policies and procedures that they have to adopt or, um, you know, I think it, it's a little... Um, if, if the requirement is that, you know, when they see the public, anytime they see the public that looks like they might be depositing something that's inappropriate to interfere, you know, to be specific about what the expectation is somehow. So let me ask you a question about that. So I'm now behind my pharmacy counter. <laughs> <coughs> and the take back container is where these Two folks are sitting from the California Alliance of Retired Americans. <laughs> and so I can see them. I can read their shirts. And now on the other side of, of them, if that is the square <coughs> where the container is, is the container <laughs> with, with a small slot. John's a container. With a small <laughs> slot. Thank you. <laughs> Audience participation. I love it. <laughs> so... So back to vigilant. So I'm here filling prescriptions. Mm -hmm. And I look up occasionally to make sure everything is secure. But, but I'm here filling prescriptions or I'm counseling somebody. Yeah. So how could there be any expectation of me to know what is either going into that container or not going into that container unless I'm there mm -hmm. being vigilant, standing there and seeing what's and going in? Or having I mean, a security guard this, posted this to it. Is a, this was in the DEA, right? Well, regardless so, of where no, it no, is. No, but, but, but I think that you've got the latitude to decrease the requirement because I see where you're going with yeah. this. Okay. And the other thing, too, I think I want to add to what Jenny said is if it's in the DEA regs, it's going to be there anyway, regardless of yeah. what we put in ours. Okay, That's cool. true, but regardless of what we do. But you don't have to enforce their regs, you have to enforce yours. And it was slightly different in the DEA reg, I don't remember yeah, but how. Yeah, but yeah. It, was, it was pretty much, that's where the concept came from. The use of the word is not a vigilant. I don't use vigilant every day. So we could put exercise professional judgment. Oh, here exercise we go. Exercise professional judgment, <laughs> <laughs> that was great. But only about color. Right. <laughs>
Um, the professional judgment being that you ought to be filling the prescription, by the way, right. in council no, year. I, yeah, and, but that's your point. How can you do everything else? You have yeah. to you can't. The bend. Yeah, that's and right. To, to intervene. I, and, and, and it even. I like the camera idea. It even says in your reg, pharmacy staff shall not review, except that. count sort. So yeah, you can't. So I really liked my language. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Uh, all board licensed, all board licensed authorized collectors should, to the extent feasible, present. Uh, sorry, prevent patients or their agents from disposing of blah blah blah. And I think when I read this, my whole thing is if I saw someone come in with a big bag of syringes and needles and just dump it in there because there was no sharps collection, do we really want that going on? Because what if some of them fell out and they're on the ground next to it? Well, can it fit in the slot also? Yeah, they could just put them in and toss them. But toss I'm their with, needles in there. I'm with Stan. I, went, I mean, can't really do I could be taking a prescription. I may not even see that bag yeah, come in. That's I mean, true. Right. So, and but you would if there was a camera right in front of you. <laughs> did you provide your language in either. your I'm comments? Be taking that I did. Okay. So they're in your comments and already. For, for, for what it's worth, I think, unfortunately, I think to the extent feasible is still going to draw a vagueness right. a concern from OAL. Yeah, um, so I think you want to be specific about what it is or indicate that it's on a, you know, basically. Laura, could we say that signage standard. should be posted to that effect? Yes, and I think that's actually elsewhere so in the regulation. that would inform so you, the public that that shouldn't be in the, the public. But, yeah. I mean, but, but maybe not by watching them and stopping and blowing a whistle if they get too close to the <laughs> Contraband. I like the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the only way you can do it. It's like when you go to the store. We don't want pharmacists watching the bins at the expense of other things in the pharmacy that exactly. really need to be attentive to. Exactly. So that, that was clearly your point, which was well, thank you very much thank for your you. consideration. And I want to thank, thank those uh, that participated with me and my uh, A good example. point, Stan. <laughs> I got you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. It's been a while since I've been before the board. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, I'm Missy Johnson here on behalf of the California Pharmacists Association and just a real quick update. I got an email this morning. The LA County ordinance has been postponed till May 17th. So for everyone who's interested in that. Oh, gosh. There you go. Change your calendar. So um, I, I, on behalf of CPHA, I'd like to thank the board and board staff for working very diligently on this very difficult issue. Um, and I'm sure there will be much more work to be done. But more, most importantly, we'd like to thank the board for adopting the language in 1776.1 I and H that refers to um, professional judgment. And a lot of discussion has already taken place today about professional judgment. Um, we really like this language. We'd like this language to stay in the regulation as it's currently drafted. We would have serious concerns with any efforts to try to define what professional judgment would mean in this instance, primarily because it would be the first time that I'm aware of that professional judgment would be defined either in, in regulation or statute. Um, so I, I understand that those are concerns raised by other individuals in the room, but we would certainly have serious concerns with um, any efforts to, do, to clearly define what that means. Um, as it relates to some of the other issues that individuals have brought up, as it relates to the physically blocked language and other items that individuals have raised as potential barriers to implementation, the inclusion of sharps and the other items in the regulation, we don't have any concern with that from our perspective, from an implementation perspective. We read the reg clearly, it's clear to us what that means, and we would be able to comply, the pharmacies that choose to, to participate or have these take back bins would be able to comply and there's no vagueness from our, from our perspective. What, the, what's your position on the blocking the access? We don't have a position, so um, I take that, I interpret that to mean that I have, wasn't told that we had any concerns with that. So as it's currently drafted, we, we, we have no issue with that and we'd comply with the reg as it's written. 
the one place where we do have some concerns with the regulation, and unfortunately it's probably the most controversial piece of this entire regulation, is the language in 1776-1A that was struck relating to the voluntary language. Um, Clearly, we have very strong positions on this because we fundamentally feel that the practice of pharmacy is something that is the distinct purview of the state and quite honestly, the locals we feel are overstepping their bounds in trying to impose requirements on pharmacies and pharmacists um, as it relates to drug take back. And to the points that were raised earlier when the young woman from the San Francisco Department of the Environment uh, was at the table and the whole issue of conflicts come, came up, we've seen how these conflicts have been resolved in previous, in, in other instances, not necessarily involving the pharmacy board, but those have gone to litigation. And case law and both an AG's opinion supports our position that the the regulation of licensed professions is the clear purview of the state. So from our perspective, we would like the regulation to be very clear that, that the language be permissive for pharmacies to, to, to participate in or host these drug take back bins if they so choose. Are you referring to the AG's opinion about the dental board and its uh, uh, position there? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, because there, I would have some serious questions if that's really germane to this case. Th that's okay, but we'd be happy to take that to court. Oh, good. So. <laughs> oh. Uh. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, Tony. you know, you're the industry. You can just do what you want. You know, you got lots of money. Uh, Tony Park again from uh, the California Pharmacists Association. Um, with regards to this whole issue of exclusive jurisdiction over this whole I huge issue of drug tape back. You know, from, from a practicing pharmacist standpoint in the state of California, um, the whole point of regulation is, is, to, is to clearly define the rules and boundaries by which the practice of pharmacy should be, or, you know, or must be. Um, and in, 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 this, in, in this space of drug tape back, this, this state agency here has the exclusive jurisdiction. Um, I can understand the political sensitivity surrounding this whole issue. Yes, we care about the environment. Yes, we care about clean water. Um, however, there are some serious concerns about the whole issue of a pharmacy taking back prescription drugs that they have no right to look in and, and, and parse out. Uh, who knows what's being dumped back into these pharmacies? There's a lot of serious concerns. For this program, but having said that, I will tell you that I personally know many pharmacists that would love the ability to take back drugs for the good of their local community. However, the, um, there are, I know equal number of pharmacists that would really have some serious professional concerns about being able to do that as well. So I, th I, I, I really appreciate this board making it, without actually saying it's voluntary, perhaps in substance, um, deferring to the pharmacist's professional judgment, but I think it would, um, I would encourage this board to take a little bit one step further and maybe not say this is outright voluntary, but perhaps say it's not mandatory. To make it really abundantly clear to pharmacists that um, they, they don't feel handcuffed or, or you know, somehow um, they feel that they must participate in such a program. If I'm a pharmacist right now, say in San Luis, San Luis County, uh, and my pharmacist has to abide by certain local county ordinances that say I must take back these drugs uh, and, and say this regulation were to pass, there's a direct conflict of law right there just waiting for me to, um, to you know, use potentially as a vehicle for litigation, I would think. Um, and I, I, I do foresee this as more and more local counties get, become more concerned about this whole issue of drug take back, uh, where pharmacists are going to be caught in the middle. And, um, you know, and as pharmacists get caught in the middle, so will, will this state agency be, be necessarily dragged into this whole conversation yet again. So perhaps in, in, you know, to foreclose that possibility of, of ba potentially bad things from happening, why not take the perhaps bold step now and like I said, not say necessarily this is voluntary, but say it's not mandatory. It's a, vol a voluntary. May, oh, by go. saying may, it pretty much uh, says that, doesn't it? Well, the, the may does make the language permissive, but we're still right. concerned that, as you heard from other stakeholders today, they're still going to try and take enforcement action against pharmacists who they believe are not complying with the local jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note, and I believe the president of the board pointed out, that the LA ordinance does um, allow for voluntary participation of pharmacies in take back right. programs because they recognize that not all pharma pharmacies are, can participate in these, nor should they. Right. So we just would like the reg to be very explicit and say that participation is voluntary. 
Now, the participation that's volunteer, are you referring to the whole program or just the receptacles? The entire program, yeah, even the program. envelopes. Yes, yes. So, Tony, I guess I'm confused. I thought you said you don't have to say it's voluntary. You well, I was, I was trying to, um, to essentially tap dance around the whole political issue of, you know, the word voluntary versus using some other word that's. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's I know. Maybe, yeah. maybe, very maybe not as like in your face. Um, you know, some language to make it really abundantly clear to practicing pharmacists that they don't come away after reading this regulation and saying, oh my gosh, I have to do all these things now. Um, because, you know, pharmacists by nature are very compliant uh, and, and, and they are very conservative in their approach and, and my concern is that they may um, mistakenly believe that they have to do this and, you know, uh, bow to local jurisdiction if, you know, presented with a situation where local law enforcement says you've got to do this. But isn't, haven't we done what you're, not what Missy's asking, but haven't we done what you're asking because we don't say it's voluntary, we don't say it's mandatory. So ha uh, haven't we done that? I, I think um, if it came down to a legal battle, yes, I agree. Substantively, I think this board has done the, that job. However, I, I'm just concerned from a, from a <laughs> pharmacist in California that I don't even want to have to go to court and defend myself in this position. Just make it abundantly clear now so I don't have to be um, facing the okay. administrative legal burdens. And so I guess that abundantly clear thing is how, how are you making it abundantly clear if you don't say voluntary, you don't say mandatory? Oh, I say, uh, so my suggestion would be to say this participation is not mandatory. How it's about not if, mandatory. If a pharmacy chooses to. Or, yeah, and the alternative, like if a pharmacy chooses or if a pharmacist chooses to participate, then. So provision right. of such, a pharmacy may choose to provide such certain. So you're, you kind of like a. Missy wants the last sentence of A, You're, you would word <coughs> the last sentence of A. I think we fixed it by just saying if a pharmacy chooses to um, uh, provide, provide take, take rights. Well, but what we're skipping around is what a county decides to do. And that's where the voluntary mandatory issue bites. Because uh, if a county says it's mandatory in this county. Well, then it is. All right. But that it's up to the county to enforce that with yeah. the pharmacy. And, but right. that but, but is then the you issue revert for to this. us. Then, right. then you revert to this, and, and we say you, you have to meet this criteria, and the pharmacist can say, okay, for a receptacle, I have to meet this criteria. Oh, I can't do that, so I guess I'm doing the, the envelope. Well, and even if we put a voluntary, I, I don't necessarily think that would preempt a locality from mm -hmm. doing that. Yeah. Well, our council said they weren't clear. Yeah. So, yeah. council's probably still not clear. From our perspective, yeah. the more, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No. If we put the word voluntary in, doesn't that raise the question of maybe we're trying to preempt a county? This is what you and Josh commented on. Yeah, yes, I think it, it definitely, um, it Are does. Raises the question. Raises yeah. the you question, yeah. but I think Sorry. ultimate. Oh. It raises the question, but the, the, I think the answer that both Josh and I gave, and I don't know where Desiree stands on this because we haven't talked about it, um, but I think the answer is that that's not going to necessarily preclude, preclude litigation. Um, so, um, I think, you know, what I, what I advised at the beginning is it's the, the board's role is to determine public what is best for to protect the public. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think by articulating the standard um, that you did, where the where the pharmacist is using his professional judgment, you're articulating you're requiring that pharmacist to exercise discretion, and and I think you're focusing on the public protection in that sense because the, the pharmacist is the one who is in the position to make that decision, so. Mm -hmm. And May is permissive. And May is clearly, and that's all so. over the regulations. So you're saying well. May is very similar to voluntary. It's yes. by, I mean, there's provisions within the BMP code and every the government code May. that all say if you use the word May, May means permissive. Mm -hmm. Yes, Victor. I'd like to make a comment here. Um, just because we have an opioid overdose epidemic, somehow people think that requiring the pharmacist to do the take-back program is a solution. Yeah. But think about all the other things that you could have done. Now, we're in the business of selling prescriptions at a pharmacy, then we are required, under all these regulations you guys are proposing, to take back the prescriptions just because I sell prescriptions. How about all the other line of business? Are the furniture store required to take back all the old furniture that you have? 
<laughs> and the restaurants need to take back all the used food they're supposed to take care of. Somebody could have a poison on the food. And we also require them, all this business, to take it back. Besides, we're not the one making all the money. It's the drug manufacturers. Those are the ones who should be responsible. Pharmacy part, look at the dispensing fee, look at the PBM, look at the contract we have. It's very little, zero dispensing fee for the pharmacists. And the narrow profit margin we're, we're making, we are being forced to take back all this stuff. But I think, I mean, Victor, we got, we got to look at the, the take back regulations. This isn't a funding issue. Right. This so is more of so it a should be optional. Access. It should be optional rather than mandatory. You would think, you think this, this is a solution, but not everybody thinks so. If you think it's well, mandatory. We are saying it's voluntary. Right. That's why I want to make that yeah. clear is because why are we doing this to the profession of pharmacy when you're not doing it to all the furniture store, all the restaurants, and all the other lines of business. Right. It's, it just has this to be about public. Yeah. Right, right. It has to be about our role in protecting the public. That's what yeah, this and, is about. And, yes. and protecting the, the public through uh, protecting the environment, too. Yes. Because it's just not, uh, I, I agree, with, I agree with uh, Victor here. The, the opiate argument, I think, is pretty shallow. It is. It is. Well, I'm going to disagree as soon as you're done. Well, I, yeah. I can't believe you disagree. <laughs> well, me and <laughs> me and the DEA. <laughs> well, I know. See, I think shallow. I think they're. I think they're wrong too. So, uh, but but nonetheless, I think the environmental impact uh, overall is, is greater, and so I so I, I think that's the real the real issue with with that. Mm -hmm. However. Just, just to, so I'm clear. Now, why were you going to take us to court specifically? We weren't I, going no. to take you to court. No, 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 no. no, no. What, what, what we are saying. I, but I missed part of that. What we are, what we are advocating for is clear language in the regulation that says that this is voluntary because we are trying to avoid the court battles between pharmacists practicing under state authorization and the local jurisdictions that are seeking to impose new requirements on them. That's the crux of the issue for us. And we've seen this play out with other professions who uh, have been subject to local ordinances um, that have ultimately been overruled by state courts because they were trying to impose requirements on licensed professionals. This has happened in the past and we just, to save everyone that grief, we would appreciate much more clarity on the front end of the regulation so it's clear that pharmacy and the practice of pharmacy is regulated at the state level and local jurisdictions can't impose requirements on us that, go, that are not within their authority. That's what our argument is. That's why we want that clarity. Could, could I comment on the so, opioid thing before we go much so. further? Uh, because uh, it's not just me and it's not just the DEA, uh, and I can't find the statistic quickly enough. However, the number of teens who opioid overdose, something like 50% of them get their drugs out of the medicine chest. It, I, I don't have the exact number, so I can't throw it at you right now, but I know it's a very significant number of opioid overdoses amongst teens are due to drugs that were not properly disposed of. And as Sacramento County has recently demonstrated, a lot of the opioid overdose come from um, non-legitimate pharmacy channels. So the opioid problem is a problem. I'm not here to say that it's not. We recognize that it's a problem, which is why CPHA has been proactive on numerous pieces of legislation. Um, someone referenced the Cures Bill or the Cures 2.0. I worked on that. That was my idea. We wanted to provide funding to provide a robust PDMP program to track the, pres uh, the prescribing of prescription drugs. We sponsored AB 1535, which made naloxone more readily available to patients to prevent the overdoses from happening in the first place. So we're not turning a blind eye to this epidemic or any other epidemic. We are just trying to determine. We want clarity in the regulation about who we report to and who is going to oversee who we believe is the Board of Pharmacy, and that's all we're asking. Otherwise, we have no issues with regulation. We would be able to comply. Those pharmacies who choose to comply with regulation have indicated to us that they can, provi uh, that they can comply. Um, so back to what Desiree said, can the May that already exists take care of that, or do we need to go to mandatory, not be mandatory? The May takes care of it. Okay. Um, you know, if you have concerns with local jurisdictions, you should you know address those directly with them. The board regulates mm -hmm. dangerous drugs and devices and the and the practice of pharmacy. Okay, yeah. So then now, in a our, our very first thing is pharmacies may provide take back provisions to the public as provided in such as it's already in there. So it's, yeah. that's what I'm pointing yeah. out is it's already in there. We maybe we don't need to. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we would ask that the, the language that was posted to the board's website yesterday strikes that language. We would like that language in A to remain. But the new A, I in guess. In the previous A. I think she's. The, 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 yeah, so you're talking previous A. The new A, oh. um, Missy, the very first sentence is pharmacies may provide yes, take Yes, yes, sorry, sorry. So I guess I'm thinking, based on what we've been told, um, that is the same as saying provisions of services voluntary. Isn't that as. It's permissive. It's permissive. It's so it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. It, it's. It's not as, uh, it's it just not depends, as but it's May is permissive and that's consistent with other business and professions code sections. If you start changing it here, it could have issues with others. That's why we have a lawyer here. <laughs> well, we actually have three. Yeah. Yes, and Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you. You can count Steve too, so we're gonna probably have 20 in here. But is Steve a real lawyer? Yeah, we've got a couple of Hi, Stan. <laughs> Who said that? Gee, I only have uh, 38 recommendations here. No, no. Um, How many pages? Um, and just just on, on one area. I just wanted to, uh, actually a couple areas. I'm just going to share a comment from a colleague, John Jones, sitting in the office. And it has to do with the sharps. And I understand that people would like to see a place for the Sharps container. Sharps, um, let's just mainly focus on the syringes. That's a high volume product as opposed to prescription drugs, low volume product. You just may want to consider <coughs> filling up a container all full of syringes and having no room for drugs as you look at this Sharps challenge that you face. Um, where I'm going is I just want to make sure I have a full understanding of this. As Amy pointed out, this whole thing revolves around a pharmacy accepting the responsibility. They may accept this. The section in 1776.1 E2 talks about a pharmacy shall not accept or possess prescription drugs returned to the pharmacy from a skilled nursing facility. I'm focusing on long-term care facilities that are closed to the public. They service all skilled nursing facilities. But if they do not choose to participate in this program, then this section that says um, they cannot possess prescription drugs returned by a skilled nursing facility does not apply to them. Is, is that correct? Can you give correct? me the page again? I'm sorry. Page two. All right. Page it's two. Okay. Section Why don't you do it, Jim? E. I think they already have right. two. Yeah. Okay, got it. I think, I think, Stan, here's, here's what you've got. In the stem of E, we're talking about the types of items that are eligible for prescription drug take-back programs in pharmacies. In number... Two, it specifically excluded um, the, the drugs coming, wait a minute, wait a minute, sorry. I lost my train A pharmacy should not yeah. accept or possess prescription drugs returned to the pharmacy by skilled nursing homes care. and residential right, care needs listed. Right, because that, that is the DEA requirement. The, the, oh. the, the skilled nursing facility has an ability for a pharmacy to contract to somehow deal oh, no, with the drugs I, I there. Fully, I, I just want to make sure that this, that this part about them not accepting drugs back, and, 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 and I'll go into my reasoning. It, it may help the board. As we talked about earlier, healthcare systems are changing. And right now in the long-term care arena, pharmacies provide drugs, I'll call them almost on consignment. When a patient is covered under the Medicare A program, meaning they required skilled care, most pharmacies charge these facilities on a per diem basis. A certain amount of money per day, they, they supply all the drugs. They issue these drugs in specially modified, uh, they're, they're called bubble packs. And on these bubble packs, they have uh, the lot numbers, the expiration dates. And so if a patient is there for eight days, 
the pharmacy charges them for eight days, they dispense 15 days, well, the balance comes back to the pharmacy and can be reused if they follow all the appropriate uh, recommendations by the board on reusing this. A lot of these drugs are so inexpensive that it's not worth the labor to reuse them, but some of these drugs cost $40, $50 a tablet. So the drugs coming back uh, from a skilled nursing facility occurs not necessarily for destruction. And I just want to make sure that, that this part here only applies if the pharmacy decides that they want to do this drug destruction program, which doesn't even fit into their, into their arena. There's all different other programs that they have that are covered with this. Mm -hmm. But so I just didn't want a general st statement saying, a pharmacy cannot take back any drugs from a skilled nursing so facility. Just so I understand, you're stating that, that a pharmacy takes back medications from a skilled nursing facility and relabels them and uses them for another patient? They may be able to do that if they comply with that patient, that drug is individually bubble packed. It has a lot number on it. It has an expiration date. It is removed from the bubble, from the, from the card. It stays intact in that individually bubble pack thing. It has a, a one year maximum expiration date by FDA requirement and they may take that drug and fit it back into another card for another patient because it has all the same requirements. And if the expiration date is less than a year, then they would have to adjust that whole card. But it's a, it's a process in which a, a drug can be returned to the pharmacy uh, because the charge to that patient is only for a specific number of days. Then when that patient changes their coverage and they become long-term care custodial and another entity is billed, an insurance company or they're, or they're private, then the pharmacy has to redispense that to the patient under, a, a, under another umbrella. I think if you look at the header to number two, it does talk about drug take-back programs. And I think the focus of this is it's supposed to be for consumers. Yes. Right now, the, farm, the, the nursing homes, physician offices have to dispose of them under a business, but, and they pay their costs and they do their own. You don't, also don't want businesses taking up I, slots I, for I, patients. I'm in full agreement. I just wanted an absolute clarification that number two only exists if, the long, if that long-term care pharmacy decides they want to go into this practice. Because the easy thing is, for these long-term care pharmacies to say, we're just not going to do this. It, it, it just doesn't work. And, and end of story. I just wanted to ask Janice about, I wasn't aware of this, of the fact that well, you could return meds from skilled nursing facilities okay, so and reuse them. What Stan's talking medical. about is the secondary packaging system. So typically what I think most of you are used to seeing is you have a bubble card, and then on one side there's foil, on this side there's the different bubbles, the 31 bubbles. You put one tablet in each of the bubbles, you close it, you heat seal it. Well, there's a secondary system where you have a card that the manufacturer already makes and there's 31 tablets already individually unit dose behind every single tablet and capsule. There's the name of the drug, the lot number, the expiration date behind every 31 tablets. So you take the secondary system you have a card, you have no bubbles, but you have holes, and you have foil on this side. So you put this secondary card into where the holes are, so it's sticking out so you can see what the tablets are. You heat seal it, you close it, you heat seal it. So what Stan's talking about in the skilled nursing facilities is PPS, right? Yes. Okay, it's the prospective payment services. It's kind of like the skilled nursing version of DRGs for hospitals. So they, they get reimbursed by a, based on their costs and expenses, and it changes, at, I don't know how many, every so many years after they get reassessed. So their reimbursement includes the cost of drugs. So what a lot of these long-term care pharmacies have done, um, and this has been over, God. Five, six years at least. No, 10 years. 10 years. Over 10 years. Yeah. Um, where pharmacies have moved towards a consignment basis. So if, because you don't know how long that patient's gonna be in a Medicare certified bed. So when you go to a nursing home, the, most ho nursing homes have moved towards, if I have 99 beds, 
I have maybe one nursing station that's certified as maybe 20 beds for Medicare patients. They come into the nursing home and they're they, based on PPS, they'll say, okay, for a hip recovery you know, from surgery, maybe 30 days. So then they qualify for 30 days for Medicare billing. So the patient is doing really well, is only there for 15 days. So what ha the pharmacy does to try to minimize how much drug is going to that patient because they're only going to get reimbursed per day for all the drugs that they're getting, that patient's using. So the pharmacy will send, most of these pharmacies will send like a two-week supply. And so they send a two-week supply in the bubble cards. Now, if they're sending it into the bubble cards that I described, the secondary system, and the, they send out a two-week supply, the patient's only Medicare for five days, they send the other card back. But if they're using the secondary system, they can heat, re, you know, apply heat, open it. All the drugs are still intact in the bubble, and they're all individually labeled. But if they're using the system where I first described where they're putting the tablets in each one, those tablets cannot be reused, okay? So the, the only time they can be reused is what, what um, FDA is saying is based on the secondary system, not the primary system. If you're, using, if you're taking drugs back in the primary system, then you have to maintain those tablets in the same card. You cannot repackage them. And, the, it, and with, with a lot of our investigations, what we're finding is when drugs do come back, they are not being, they're not packaged in the secondary system. Their primary, their package in the primary system, pharmacies are punching it out and recycling it without giving, um, they're not, you know, they're supposed to be for destruction, but they're diverting it and then reusing it. So those are the type of cases that we investigate. But, but there are actually, what, what's going on here in this section is this is talking about what kind of prescription drugs is the pharmacy going to see if it's doing drug take back. So one, the drugs that come into the pharmacy from patients or their agents that walk into the pharmacy, the pharmacy can't help them sort them, handle them, or do anything else. They're just pointed, go put them over there. If they're coming in from a skilled nursing facility and they're being returned to the pharmacy for credit, then you've got the ability to do it. But otherwise, the pharmacy can't take those drugs back. That's what two is. Three is the pharmacy itself that has drugs in quarantine can't walk over, take those quarantine drugs, and dump them in the collection bin itself. They're to keep those in a separate waste stream with the reverse distributor. So that's really what those three things are. That if a pharmacy's doing this, they don't want skilled nursing drugs ending up in the pharmacy, in the pharmacy premises collection bin. That's what the issue is. And, and that, uh, thank you, Janet. And that makes it clear to me. But when you look at just two straight line across, saying that a pharmacy a pharmacy shall not accept or possess prescription drugs returned to the pharmacy by skilled Into nursing homes. Into the collection homes, bin. This is only if the pharmacy chooses to have a collection bin. And I, that's the part right. I just wanted we'll just to make. We'll just add the words. Okay. I wanted to make sure it was very, very clear. Okay. Stand into the collection bin. Yeah. Right. right. Because the, the goal is, is to keep the, otherwise the, the nursing home itself is right. the We're repository. So, Thank you very much. So Stan, yes. with regards to your question and item number two, I mean, I, I presume that <clears throat> when we're talking about skilled nursing homes, residential care, and, and, and the double bubble pack and everything, you're talking about a specialized pharmacy close it, shop. Exactly. And there's, there's no way there's going to be a bin in there anyway. Well, uh, I understand, but um, the long-term care profession is, is trying to make sure it complies not only with your regulations, but also with an enormous amount of regulations that govern the nursing homes. Yeah. Sure. And so we, we just, you know, there's, there's two worlds that, that we live in. Um, worlds and, collide in this and, case. and let's not have worlds collide. Very well put. Very well put on that. Thanks. Nick. Thank you very, okay. very much. So, you, so I have one clarification then. Okay, I just want to verify. So if the pharmacy is a long-term care pharmacy and they decide not to put collection bins at the nursing home, then drug if the nursing home has drugs that needs to be disposed, they still cannot take back drugs just for the purpose of destruction. 
That's the way I read the DEA regs. They can they can accept them back for purposes of credit, okay. where that's appropriate in system two or whatever you called it. Yeah. But but the DEA does not want the drugs going back into the pharmacy. Okay. And to let you know what's happening in the industry, as Janet probably already knows, is that the facilities are now utilizing new products that have come onto the market. One is a a, a liquid called RX Destroyer, so that they're able to put their <coughs> destroyed drugs into this RX Destroyer. Now, according to the manufacturer, um, they said that after these drugs are put in this thing and it creates a solid mass and destroys all the drugs, and, and, and these are drugs as well as patches, you name it, it goes in there, that it can be put into their trash. But in December of last year, the board said no, that would rather be placed into a biohazardous waste. So some small facilities do not have biohazardous waste. And there may be, uh, with, with the board's understanding, this is where a long-term care pharmacy or a pharmacy could help them dispose of it into their biohazardous waste. These are drugs that are already destroyed. The other type of product inside the long-term care facility is called a smart sink. And that basically is a, a sink. It's, it fills up with uh, liquids in one section, um, patches in another, and uh, uh, tablets in another. And once that thing is full, that goes back to a reverse distributor that, that is contracted with the, the, the facility. And it's pretty much hands off. Um, most long-term care pharmacies do not want to take back drugs. They, you know, they don't want the hassle of it, but at the same time, they also don't want a, a small little six bed board and care and throwing these down the toilet uh, because they have no other choice and they don't know where to go and no, I'm not gonna walk to the police station and I, I just gotta get rid of these drugs. So it's a, it's a changing environment, but hopefully we'll keep you informed of some of these changes and we're all on the same page on this. Yep. And Janice, do, can they recycle controlled substances? No. Uh, steel dressing facilities, I mean, pharmacies no. cannot take back any control. No. Okay. no control. Regardless of the right. packing no. system. Because the way DEA okay. looks at, um, they want to have a, a closed system. And everyone involved in the closed system is registered with the DEA. Mm -hmm. So once you dispense it to a patient, that patient is, no, is not a registrant with DEA. Mm -hmm. So they don't want anything coming back into something, into a system that's a closed system. Mm -hmm. and, and to answer that, in most of these long-term care facilities where that patient is part A and they have a controlled drug order, that's where these automated dispensing machines come in and e-kits because the pharmacy doesn't want to put out um, uh, 20 methadone tablets and have to throw them out and the facility doesn't want to pay for them when the patient only needs one methadone tablet after having some surgery or, or morphine or whatever the case may be. So, you know, um, everything's sort of moving as, as, uh, as we talked earlier and hopefully we'll be able to present a lot of this to the licensing committee so that you have a full understanding on well, what's happening out there, and, and thank goodness Janice has that background, and she she has this understanding. But our goal is to try to share it with everyone. Thanks, Dan. Thank you again. Any other public comment? Um, hi, Douglas Barkon again. Um, just one thing. I think Stan and Dan has covered it pretty well on the long-term care side, uh, but the, but they also opened a can of worms at the same time. When it comes to the secondary packaging on uh, these, these bubble packs, um, there have been virtually no studies done uh, that show the, the stability of these drugs once they are um, de-blistered, uh, not de-blistered, but removed from their, their outer carrier, but kept, it, but kept in the, the uh, secondary carrier. When the manufacturers do the, the blister packing, it's a half a second or less typically at around 300 degrees, and they seal it off completely. The long-term care pharmacies, they're doing 300 degrees for somewhere typically eight seconds to seal these cards and things. When you're bringing things back that are in an outside carrier already and have to reheat them again, 
you've now got 300 degrees for eight seconds the first time you did it. And then if, if you're going to reuse those again, it's, it's eight more seconds to pull the, the outer carrier off, then you then put the new carrier back on. Uh, you got possibly 24 seconds or so of that heat of 300 degrees. Um, there are limited studies, not many. Um, there are limited studies, not many, that show that certain drugs um, do show indications of physical damage to them from the heat. Okay, I don't. I don't mean to cut you, but we I don't know. have. We're not agendized right I now know. to discuss drug take back right. or reuse. We're talking about pharmaceutical take back. Correct. I so just I just want, want to make sure the board's aware. Yes, that since, would be a future agenda item. Right. Since it came up in, as part of this okay. discussion, Good. but other than other than that, on seventeen uh, seventy six point one, on E two, I walked in a little bit late from lunch, but um, on two, on E two. The last word, or last two words, are other entities. Should those be on there? Because that's open, open to any type of a of a of, of a category. We don't want them taking back drugs for destruction into their take back bin from other entities. Okay. What's that, the definition of other entities? Yeah, what's an entity? Well, if, if, if it's not one of these, there could be other entities that may have. Commercial entities that would have access to non -con drugs. non consumers. Because technically, a person is an entity also. Well, the persons would be pointed to the container and go put them in there yourself. Right. In this case, it would be another business would, or something that would. Could we in. say commercial entities or something? Or I don't know if commercial. Business would be. entities. Business entities. I, I don't suppose it adds anything. We could end the thing after a healthcare practitioner. The goal is to not have outside commercially driven lots of unwanted drugs going into that collection sure. bin, that there are other systems out there to get rid okay. of those drugs from mm. those. Okay, and then I, one, one last thing. I don't see it in the reg, and it, the DEA didn't have it, I don't believe, either. What about um, IVs that are, that are not, that have been discontinued in a nursing home or something, like an, an antibiotic IV? Those are, still, those are pharmaceuticals. They're pharmaceuticals, but but, they're, but, the, but if if a, if it's a home care patient, they have access to that. Where do those go? That's the, the they're same, the more the same process ones. we've just been talking about. They would go okay. to the collection bin unless they read the morning. That was some old, of the cons some of the concern we heard was on chemo infusions right. and the fact that they would be deposited in here. That was the whole reason the yeah. cancer drugs were added on there. Okay, but but do you want to put the put the terminology of of, of injectable or? or, or or hang on, injectable won't fly because you've got uh, vials of drugs that might come back that are a Schedule II or something like that. I think it's any like pharmaceutical. It's any pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. then. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Any other public comment? Yeah, what, can we let the other people and then we'll, come, we'll get back to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Manuel Medrano. I'm with the city of Chula Vista, and this is? My name is Patty Taves, and I'm with the San Luis Obispo County Integrated Waste Management Authority. I'm the program director there, and I'm the one who's implemented the program that you guys have been talking about all day. Which, which county are you with? I'm sorry. San Luis Obispo. Oh, there you are. All right. <laughs> and I'm in San in Diego. House. I'm in San Diego County. Um, we support um, what our colleagues from uh, Santa Rosa and from uh, San Francisco have brought up. Um, as a, a local jurisdiction, we do want uh, standardization of your rules uh, for your ph pharmacies. As a layperson reading this rulemaking, uh, I do not see anywhere where it's requiring pharmacies to do this. So it's as long as we have standardization of the rules for all our pharmacies to follow, that's wonderful. Um, I could tell you that. Um, in regards to the uh, and uh, the preloaded medication uh, with the sharps or, or syringes with preloaded medication, that should be added uh, to that uh, list of acceptable items, I guess, uh, and struck from the other section, because more and more we see these medications in our containers um, unused, and and we see that a lot of the, the industry is moving towards a lot of prescribing that uh, uh, that the type of medication. So. If we could at least add that on there, that would be great um, because we don't, um, for the most part, we don't see in our, in a, a lot of empty syringes in these containers. We see most of the, pre, at least I see a lot of preloaded medication in there, the EpiPens and 
uh, Stellara and a lot of the other medication that uh, is not no current, not used anymore. Yeah, so. Before you go on, uh, and, and this is, you know, we've been talking about uh, the security of the meds, et cetera. Why do you use them? I'm not implying anything. I, I, I just want to know the process. Uh, where we stand as far as this, uh, the programs in our city, uh, we have a receptacle in our police station. So that's, that's uh, uh, what we have on there, and it's, uh, our, our costs have been uh, you know, pretty much doubling uh, since its inception in uh, 2009, uh, actually doubled as of, as of last year. And um, we also have a uh, mailback service for our residents <coughs> that we fund uh, at our local larger, uh, the, the local uh, chain pharmacies. Uh, and standardization will work great because we have some great participants in this program, but we have others from certain chains that either because of turnover or just lack of education or the employees, they don't know how to use this program. And it's, a, it's super simple because people can walk up, show proof of residency in, their, in, in Chula Vista, and get either a, a, a mailback envelope for, for pharmaceuticals or a one-quart mailback container for Sharps. Oh, oh, so, no, no. But, but, I mean, but my point is, how come, you know, when you say you've seen these, these uh, preloaded syringes, et cetera, how come you've viewed what's come back? Uh, oh, when we have our contractor um, collect the waste from our receptacle at the uh, police station, they actually have to empty them out into oh, a container. Okay, so you're seeing them we down. see them in there. Oh, yeah, okay. that's how I see them. Yeah, yeah. So, I, of course, we don't, you know, double handle oh, the waste. <laughs> no, but no. <laughs> but they stand <laughs> out. They quite, I mean, they're bright yellow or orange. They stand <laughs> out. Right no, I was so just curious about the, the, the process. Yeah. How, how is your mail serve program going? I mean, do you get a lot of uptake with individuals that want mail back envelopes? Uh, we do, uh, but like I said, uh, we have certain pharmacies that are uh, actually active participants, and they do provide it, and they offer it to the residents. We have others uh, that... Uh, again, because of either employee turnover, they just forget about the program, even though we do quite a bit of education mm -hmm. ourselves. And you're funding it. And we're funding it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, um, it would help us tremendously because then those, those pharmacies that are not participating, they, we could go to them and say, look, it's just something that's approved by your board, and here's a program, and we're funding it. It's actually a 27, 21 to $27 sale, depending on what pharmacy is, basically. It's a free, it's a, it's a sale that the, the, the city of Chula Vista is paying for. It's, uh, it's sustainable for now, but we don't know in the future how sustainable it will get once we promote even more. So um, again, uh, thank you very much for taking this on. It will help tremendously, uh, but there are some issues that, echoing what our, the City of San Francisco and City of Santa Rosa colleagues have mentioned. Thank you. Oh, before you go, local $21, $27? Uh, the cost for the mail back for the Sharps, I, would, I should say. Uh -huh. Uh, containers are between 21 and 27 dollars. That's the point of sale. That's yeah. probably because it's heavier. Yeah. The weight. And they're big and bulky. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, selling an empty box in a box. So. Okay, but but you mentioned that your receptacle, people could throw anything in it. In the receptacle, only uh, pharmaceutical waste. Uh, so but then shops, we, they could put to, to other shops. But shops you, end up in that container. Yeah. But you would know if they throw in some. You know, chemotherapy or no, chemo we drugs in it too. No, the only reason why we see is that the preloaded sharps is because we could clearly see them. But so the um, the waste company people would opening up and then sort them out. No, they do not. They no. don't. No. Who's no. Who? He said the sheriff's department. Oh, the yes. sheriff's department opened up and, and, and the sort them out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. they can do it. Yeah, but they do not sort out. They just open up, empty it into another container, package it up. Uh, but then we could, like I said, we could see them right in front of us. So when, she, when they see there the shops, well, how do they handle them? They send well, it we to don't even handle it. We leave it yeah. in there, we package it up. And send it to the, the waste send it up to the, to the incinerator that the police department uses. So. I see. Do the police know that they are handling possibly a chemo agent and a female police officer maybe putting herself in harm's way? They're not handling it. Um, they're not putting their hands in them. They get from, it goes from one box to another cardboard box that gets sealed. So it, they're not at any point handling it. I'll leave that to the board. Okay. They, they may have some recommendations. And it, this is the program that's done inside of the police department. So. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about a program that's been instituted for over a year now. So a lot of things have come up here that are not based on fact. And what I'd like to do is have everybody take a deep breath and just relax about this. Let's deal with facts instead of fiction. You mentioned the kiosk color. Believe it or not, that's an issue. I've had so many people say to me, do you have anything with more bling 
kid you not, anything that's prettier. People take pride a in their... Yeah. A pharmacy said that to you? A pharmacist has yes. said to you, I want a yes. kiosk with bling? Yes. I mean, that was the, the technical... They are trying to be funny, obviously, but, but, but they take pride in their pharmacies. They want them to look good. And believe it or not, white, they just didn't think was that pretty. So... It is so, an issue. So they refused to have a receptacle in their pharmacy because it wasn't pretty? No, 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 no. Not refused because in, in some instances they still accepted them begrudgingly, right? But they still accepted them. So to say that it's not an issue, interestingly enough, it is. And again, I'm not talking emotion here. I'm talking facts, okay? You mentioned that furniture stores and food restaurants should be taking back things. We're more, moving more and more towards circular systems like that. Mattress recycling, battery recycling. You're gonna see this more and more. TV, electronics, the oil recycling. It's gonna happen with other commodities. We're moving there, we're not there yet. We also have, and I, I can't remember who mentioned it, space. Interestingly enough, and this is a fact, in our county, the smallest pharmacy has a kiosk, okay? So, and they, their pharmacy is so small that he took out a chair, left two chairs, and it's literally three steps to the counter. That's it. That's how small it is. Much smaller than this area right here. Now, he feels it's possible and doable. Enough said. Let's also talk about break-ins, because we all have pharmacies, wherever you are, who have break-ins. The question is, we have two pharmacies in our county who have been broken into after instituting this program. Both of these pharmacies have kiosks. Did they change? No, they kept the kiosks. Why? Because the break-in, those who broke in, didn't touch the kiosks. They're bolted to the ground. They're locked. They wouldn't want anything to do with it. They didn't even try to beat on it, right, to get it. They went directly to another source of medication. So, again, deep breath. You may be in a dangerous neighborhood. You may be broken into, but you may be broken into whether the kiosk is there or not. Both of these pharmacies, again, still have the kiosks. They have also been broken in prior to the kiosks, okay? Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so it's not a perfect system, the San Luis system, but it's a system that works. The bottom line is everybody in this room wants to get pharmaceuticals out of the medicine cabinet. It only takes one teenager in a car with their buddies to be a freight train. We gotta remember that. It's not a bad system to get pharmaceuticals out. We really need to focus on that, okay? And instead of adding layers and layers of legislation or layers and layers of rules, let's make it simple and clear. Let's not overstep the DEA regulations. Let's just go forward. The San Luis Obispo County proves that it can be done and it's successful. Is it uh, the San Luis Obispo County Ordinance, and uh, just because I heard this from one of the organizations at our last meeting, does it have, what are the penalties for the pharmacists that aren't are participating? It's a thousand dollar a day fine. I heard there was criminal penalties if they didn't par participate. We haven't gotten to that yet. But is in the ordinance? Yeah, it is. Do you have a copy of the ordinance? we can look at with me no but you can go to iwma.com and it has all of our ordinances not only do we have a medicine take back ordinance but we also have a sharp ordinance if you're a pharmacy in our county you hand out free sharps containers and take back sharps for free <clears throat> we also have a battery ordinance in our county if you sell batteries you take those back for free we also have a fluorescent tube lighting ordinance in our county we also have a paint ordinance in our county. You see, it's getting more and more circular with these products. If you sell them, you take them back. We also have a mercury thermostat ordinance in our county that if you sell thermostats, you need to take them back for free. Now, many of these ordinances, industry saw the writing on the wall, stepped up to the plate, for example, paint, 
battery is now doing so in the mercury thermostat. So these um, ordinances spurred change. So does your county pay for the receptacle? Which receptacle? The, the, for the truck take back at the pharmacy. That's correct. We did. We mm -hmm. bought the kiosks. And who is responsible for picking it up? Is the pharmacy personnel or the waste management company? Who is re responsible for, for picking, picking up, up the, uh, the take back stuff inside the receptacle? The, are we talking medication? Are we whatever, talking sharps? Whatever. Are we talking do batteries or fluorescents? Do you have two receptacles? We do. Also, oh, one for the shops and then one for the uh, regular pharmaceuticals. That is correct. How often do they come and pick them up? It depends on need, how often they fill up. When okay, a so, pharmacy so is three quarters staff full. will tell them and say, this is all fill up, and they'll come out and. Actually, when they're three quarters full, they call. They'll call. Okay. And are they paying for the envelopes too? They are. The pharmacy, now, a pharmacy pays for does, the envelopes. That's correct. The pharmacy does not have to have a kiosk. They can use envelopes if they choose. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, 34 of the pharmacies in our county are using envelopes. 10 have chosen kiosks. So the mm -hmm. kiosk is payable by the city, but then mm -hmm. the envelopes payable by the pharmacy. I'm sorry, the container, the kiosk container was purchased originally by the city. Oh, okay. The pharmacy is also responsible for the disposal costs inside that kiosk each time they need a pickup. Okay, do you know roughly how much it costs for each pharmacy? At this point in time, we have grant funding to cover it, okay. but eventually down the road, we won't. It's roughly about, depending on how much it weighs, because what happens is it gets sent by common carry to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So it could be as little as 23 pounds. We see it as high as 80 pounds. And it depends, again, price per pound. And the price fluctuates depending on what the common carrier decides to do. Our pound, uh, our kiosk at our police department, it's $4 a pound. And then, the yeah, and then plus a, a, a pickup charge of uh, $75. So every time they're there, $75 plus whatever poundage we get in there. So, so 60 pounds is 240 plus 75 dollars yeah. and yeah. and that's why I hesitate to force a pharmacy to go in one direction or the other ie adding more rules and regulations I think that it's really important to give pharmacies a choice and oftentimes that choice is based on financial so I hesitate to force one pharmacy or feel like the pharmacies need to have to use the envelopes which are extremely expensive or vice versa kiosks Choice and if they don't participate, nice. they get the fine. That's correct. But so That's you're correct. supportive then of what we have because they, they have a choice. I do support choice. I think that's really, really important. I would back off on some of the language, but I do support <laughs> choice. Well, what do the envelopes cost? You said they're very expensive. About 450 a pop. Now, what I've done is per, or brought in some of these envelopes. Now, you can imagine the challenge when grandma passes away and there's an entire medicine cabinet full. Garbage right? can full of stuff. Mm -hmm. right. right. Well, the other thing we heard is that, I, I heard this from some of the pharmacies, is that since they're required to pay for the postage, some of the times the patients don't use those. They're required to give them out but they don't use it. So then what they're doing is they're handing out envelopes that just contribute to waste Here. that's going into landfill. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Anything like that's possible. Really seriously. Mm -hmm. You can give people a solution and they may or may not use it. Sorry about that. So you're absolutely correct. But they're not required in the <coughs> same way when you say they're required to hand out an envelope. They're required to offer it. People can decline and often do. Now, if you have somebody who comes back in over and over and over, inside the ordinance, there's language that protects the pharmacy. They're only required to provide one envelope per month per retail customer. So if I'm coming in and I'm getting my antibiotic, and right. I know that I'm going to use it, and I figure I might as well, if it's free, I might as well take the bag. And you know you're not going to use an antibiotic? I, oh could, I could be used at my own whole supply. Okay. But the pharmacy's offering it to me because it doesn't cost me anything. I right. figure my, I might as well take it. You can, and you're welcome to do that. That's why I say we shouldn't force a pharmacy into the envelope option only. They may want to go with a kiosk, which is less expensive. 
So, so could I ask a couple of questions on, on some of the issues that have come up over the course of the day? Uh, the provision we have about medical waste, uh, uh, I, I, how did that quite go? That we have some standard on medical waste that, oh, that these have to be taken away in a format that is only it's on page one. Right. Yeah. So, what, what's your thought on that requirement? Remove that word, medical waste. Okay. Uh, and then uh, blocking the access, that's an issue that's been coming up uh, consistently today. I think that's been pointed out that no matter what, even if you put a fence around the entire parking lot, people are going to still drop off. I, it's, it's like, I hate to see that language. I do, because it, it just makes me heart sick. Because no matter what, if somebody's going to drop it off, they're going to drop it off. So what's been the experience with that in your county? It hasn't. City? happened and I know you're gonna okay, say so you yeah said, right, you said it sure. would happen but it actually in, in your situation it hasn't happened no anytime anybody has a problem I say give me a call instantly because I'm there to solve problems for people anytime a customer's in your face anytime they're making demands that overstep the bounds I'm there instantly so San Luis Obispo County doesn't have any of these uh, patients who drop bags of drugs by the uh, kiosk and leave not yet. Okay. Now, 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 now let's, let's be clear on this. I, you know, when I first started going out to pharmacies, people said, well, people are going to strap on bombs and walk in here. <sighs> Can we stop everything? Like he said, no, we can't. Can you stop these people from dropping off their medication? No, we can't. Can we stop people from illegally dumping mattresses? No, we can't. Can we stop people from dumping their TVs on this? No, we can't. <sighs> But we do need to take a deep breath and realize that we cannot solve every single issue. So it's the just kiosks, the nature so of the the kiosks beast. are always open regardless of whether the pharmacy is open or not. So you said the kiosks are always open? Oh, right. No. Is that what you say? No? No. That's what I'm not saying. What I'm saying is to put a fence around it, let's say you're in a Rite Aid and they can run a chain link fence. The, the kiosk is where you're sitting there, Stan. People, if they're going to dump off that bag, they're still going to go and that, walk out. That's what we are proposing here, just to close the kiosk or the receptacle when the pharmacy is closed. So I guess... I mean, uh, no, uh, we're actually proposing more, which was to put a physical barrier between the kiosk... So can we just kind of get to the... I'm, I'm kind of a bottom line kind of person. So... Um, what is it that you're, I mean, can you like go through here like the others and say, I think in, um, you know, 1776.1, I think you should change this, you should change that. Or are you planning on providing us with a letter to tell us, you know, how Definitely planning on providing you with a letter okay. outlining it in writing. That's and the reason a, being, ladies and I mean, gentlemen, is because we- you're saying, I we think we're actually aligned here. Yeah, I think so too, is that we just received this a little too close to develop some proper wordage. I mean, you can always throw out language quickly, but it needs to be well thought out, as we all know here. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other public comment? Uh, good afternoon, and uh, I also uh, applaud the board for taking this on. It's been a, a long-standing issue, and it's got a lot of things. I just have a couple of things to point out, primarily for clarity, but some of them are substantive. The first thing I'll point out, I know we had a discussion earlier around whether these receptacles uh, need to be placed. And uh, it, in one of your documents here, and I'll refer you to page 4, 1776.3, in the first sentence, it says a collection receptacle in the pharmacy. So if you're now decided it really doesn't have to be in the pharmacy, meaning in the licensed space, then um, you know that probably needs to be corresponding with whatever it was you decided about premises. However, I will comment on that, yes, in many pharmacies, perhaps most in the state, uh, the, the licensed space ends at the counter where the prescriptions are taken in or sold to the patient. But in many other pharmacies, the license space also includes the waiting area. And uh, so, you know, for clarity, uh, you, you can't 
just assume that the common pharmacy, which might be the chain drugstore, is the predominant. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the supermarkets, for an example, have started adding um, consultation rooms, which are also part of the licensed space. And in fact, in some of those, if you, you can't even see anything other than the waiting room from the prescription counter. And so, you know, I, I don't know how you're going to resolve that, but if you're saying they can put it outside of the licensed space, or, uh, mm -hmm. so I think you need to recognize that some of the pharmacies are actually going to put them in their licensed space. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have a drop-down metal door or screen between the waiting room and the pharmacy itself. Okay. They just lock the door and they're closed. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, the other one um, that is on my list is... Um, I think, uh, just going in more or less uh, numerical order, um, in 1776.1 on page 2, down near the bottom, we had a discussion about subsection E and then 2, and we talked about the other entities. I think uh, there's some clarification that needs to be, uh, I mean, that just really opens it up. So do you mean, for an example, that when a patient comes into the emergency room in a hospital and they bring in their prescription drugs, which many of them do or they're asked to do, or in a medical office and they're asked to do, and those prescription drugs um, are basically left with the emergency room or left with the doctor's office, that somebody from that doctor's office cannot walk across the hall to the receptacle and put those in the receptacle on behalf of the patient. I, again, it's, that happens all the time, probably daily in medical centers. So, pe so patients do bring in what has been dispensed to them by a pharmacy and leaves them with the physicians. Now, I'm not talking about the drugs that the physician has let go out of date or the emergency right, room. Right. So just some clarity. Are, are you well, down there on G? Where, where are you? On uh, new section E2, e. Two. Two, where it says entities. Thank you. We don't regulate physicians. We don't have any control over physicians, nor do the DEA regs talk about what physicians may and may not. So, but what so you do say here is a, a pharmacy shall not accept. They can't accept them from a physician. Physicians frequently give pharmacy samples. If they give pharmacy samples I, I agree. and they want to deposit them in the take back bin, that would be disallowed. But the requirement is on the pharmacy, not on the prescriber. Right. But if the physician, if a patient has left their drugs in the medical office, right. can the pharmacy put accept those into their receptacle? Well, if they gave it to the doctor. I don't. I, the doctor has possession. I don't know. I, I don't know. How are we going to know that? I don't. Well, it, it, and you also are talking about hospitals, and that happens all the time in the hospitals. So can the hospital, if they, have a if they have a receptacle, can they put the patient's medication that is left with them in the receptacle is the question. According to the DEA regs, it would be the patient that would or the patient's agent that would have to put them in there. If the patient leaves them in the ER, common sense would indicate that, the, that someone would take those drugs and deposit them okay. in the take back. Yeah, I, We're not in the middle of that. We don't regulate the prescriber okay. or the ED. As, as long as uh, you know, the inspectors understand, and I think many of them do because they've worked out there, I think that this understand. happens all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to be in the middle of that transaction. Okay. Uh, and it has been a problem because for years nobody knew what to do with those. You know, and, you know, so. Well, um, well Steve, I think it says that they could put in the receptacle, but they cannot give it to the pharmacy. That's, yeah, what, that's exactly. what E2 yeah. is. They cannot give it to the pharmacy. To, they to they could the dump in the receptacle. Exactly fine, right. but the pharmacy itself cannot accept them. The more substantive issue, I, I am still concerned over this issue of the voluntariness. Um, in your page 3 on 1776.1, I, um, mm -hmm. you, you leave it to the pharmacist in charge. The reality is you need to leave it to both the pharmacist in charge and the permit holder. It's the permit holder that owns the pharmacy or the hospital that owns the pharmacy that's going to be at risk and is going to have to provide uh, the resources to take care of this. I know you said earlier that you had, there was some discussion about, well, a, an entity that owns pharmacy can just not make a decision one way or the other. And many of them, as Walgreens has indicated, will make decisions that some pharmacies are okay for it and some pharmacies are not. And I think that you need to change that to say that uh, if in the professional judgment of the pharmacist in charge or the permit holder, uh, or in the judgment of the permit holder, the pharmacy cannot meet the requirements, 
uh, because otherwise you're going to get right into the middle of a lot of labor issues. So if we do that, then we, there's an issue that we heard earlier about some chain drug stores basically saying we're not going to do this And, and I, think, I think as the lady before me just said, you can't solve everything. And I think as entities come forward, um, like Walgreens in the room today, and they say we're going to do this where it makes sense, where we can, the market will take care of itself, as we've indicated. There are pharmacies that are independently owned that make those decisions. Most of the chains, most of the large entities have not been reluctant to do this because they didn't necessarily want it or believe that it was important. They were waiting for the regulations to come out from the DEA and the Board of Pharmacy to outline what we had to do. That's really been the delay. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, I am. Well, that's good. I'm not. So, <laughs> um, and if we do go back to just saying that the owners can just decide, uh, then in fact we are opening the door to just a right. blanket uh, chain uh, deciding they're not going to have it anywhere. Right. But, and, and, and giving them a way out. Also, during that discussion, there was raised the issue about what does it mean by the professional judgment of pharmacy of the pharmacist in charge. I got nervous when I heard it say, well, then that would be brought before the Board of Pharmacy, and the Board of Pharmacy would be called in to, make, to judge whether this was a proper professional judgment for a pharmacist or not. And then so you're going to get, that, that's what was the audience said, perceived. Who said that? Here that the professional judgment would be an entity of the Board of Pharmacy. I think that there were two issues that were being discussed, and if I'm remembering correctly, counsel indicated that the Board of Pharmacy investigates unprofessional conduct. So if there was a complaint filed, the Board would investigate. But with respect to questioning whether or not a individual was using it, was circumventing the local ordinance professional judgment, that is something that the Board of Pharmacy is not involved in, that the local entity would be doing. Okay, so if the local entity filed a complaint with the Board of Pharmacy saying that this pharmacist in charge misused his professional judgment under this regulation, I think what I heard you just say then, because a complaint was filed, you would investigate and you would come to a conclusion. Right, and then and then when it, when the when the pharmacist in charge and or the pharmacy owner end up going to court with the local ordinance people, then they would want to know what the Ford of Pharmacy concluded about this complaint and the investigation of the professional judgment. All I'm saying is that be careful about that because that's the way it would play out. We get invited a lot to testify in civil litigation involving an individual that's got a lawsuit against a pharmacist right. that inappropriately perhaps dispensed a drug. We decline to participate okay. in those discussions, and I would suspect that we might decline to participate right. in similar. Simply, we just don't have staff to be witnesses to a world full of litigious behavior. I, I can appreciate that. And, and so, um, again, my suggestion is I really believe that on subsection I, you need to talk about this is a judgment that both the pharmacist in charge and the permit holder have some concern over for that. Okay. So are you saying leaving the old, uh, leaving the old 1776.1A as voluntary, then you need, don't even need that I? No, I'm, I'm not really saying that. I think that this is adds some clarity to it. But the permit holder is also responsible for making a decision whether they can meet the requirements of the law, both the federal and the state law, and, and the local. So uh, it's not just the judgment of the pharmacist in charge. And, and, and you're going to get right in the middle of that. Thank you. Any other public comment? I think we had this lady here who wanted to come up again for the second time. Can we let her go first? <laughs> And I think it may be super fast. I'm on page six, uh, skilled nursing part, uh, 1776.4, skilled nursing part A, where it says um, that the first long sentence, using mailbag packages or envelopes and packages based upon request by the resident patient. Is it just normally understood that resident patient can also mean their POA if they have dementia? I think so. I, I just don't know your I world. Mean, I would, I, I do not ask yes. counsel, but usually, <coughs> she said, what they're saying is if a power of attorney, if well, someone has dementia and they have a power of attorney, a, you know, their 
their child or a family yeah. member, they could make that decision. Because yeah. otherwise, you're yeah. living in yeah. all, yeah. yeah. And I think the real reason is if the patient wanted to take it with them, I mean, they could, it is their property to have the medication. It is. Yeah. And that's, that's um, maybe Stan could re respond to it. But uh, with regards to drugs, when somebody's being discharged from a skilled nursing facility, uh, there's often a discussion about the meds that they have paid for, or somebody has paid for on their behalf, whether or not they're going to take it home or not take it home. I would imagine that there's the same type of discussion in the, okay. uh, f well, for all patients and even in the event of the demise of the patient. Well, I was speaking more mm -hmm. to having dealt with a mother with dementia for many, many years. Well, these are, these are you know, people who would be responsible for your mother and then people who would if be that's responsible taken for her, by her, care, then her care is speaking to you, the responsible party, I would guess. Yeah, that's what I wanted to be sure was. But yeah, that needs to be clarified is what she's saying. Yeah, but I'm that's not all. Sure we need I don't think that's our. If, you know, if that's it's standard procedure, understanding, yeah, it's, yeah. interface with patients and their caregivers. Yeah. Okay. Right. You're right, Jenny. Thank you, <laughs> Doug. You want to come oh, I up? Got one sure. finally. Thank you. <laughs> sure. uh, Doug Bark. Uh, Doug Bark on again. Uh, going back to what Steve was saying a few minutes ago. Uh, about a year ago, I had a dialogue going with Mike Lewis of the DEA trying to resolve the issue of controlled drugs that are being uh, brought from home by patients and left in the hospitals. And the same holds for, for patients in the ER. Um, Mike had no idea. He referred it to Washington. It sat for months, never got a reply back. Then the, then the new DEA rule came out and it was essentially incorporated in that, which meant that any drug that's brought into the hospital uh, and the patient does not take it home with them or the patient expires in the hospital, whatever it might be, um, the next legal recourse you've got is the patient's uh, family member who legally is entitled to receipt of those drugs. And if that doesn't exist, it would have to go to law enforcement <coughs> because supposedly from what the, the, the law is written as that the CSA, whichever one it was here, that uh, the pharmacy cannot take, take ownership, which means transfer from the ER into a pharmacist's hands or something or other, or hospital employee, because they are registrants, they cannot place that into the collection bins. It has to be either the family member or law enforcement. So, that, and that, that's where we're, dealing right now with trying to do a, a drug take back policy with CSHP, trying to come up with something that works for everybody and it's a real challenge. So just consider all of that. Thank you. Sure. Any other public comment? <coughs> Hi, Lori Hensek from Kaiser Permanente. Um, I just wanted to thank the board for taking into consideration of looking into a little bit more clarity with respect to um, vigilance and and how that's going to play out in terms of accountability and I I ask that as you continue those discussions or look into that that you also consider looking into 1776.1 e1 um, which specifically states that the pharmacy shall not review basically the the contents that are being uh, returned and so there's a little bit of um, counter statements in here and so we just want to make sure that it's very clear when one section, um, I take this as, I'm, I'm guessing that the intent of this statement was that after the fact, after it was disposed, you're not supposed to somehow open the receptacle and look at the contents. Um, but I think that there is some confusion on the part of many pharmacists who are concerned when they hear that they're supposed to make sure that the right things are and are not going in, yet there's also a statement that says you're not supposed to review it. So um, if in those discussions when you look to clarify the vigilance, if you can consider um, section E and the subsections mm -hmm. as well, that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, we've got a motion on the table and we've got a second. What, what's the motion again? The motion is to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to so long ago. and open for 15 day comment. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay, move the draft as it was released and open for 15 day comment. Exactly. Second. Second right here with Greg. Um, All right, so may, uh, so we got a motion. Well, on I think the table. we've got it, we've got a vote on right. the motion.
first. Well, what if somebody proposes an amendment or we do this? You can propose it to uh, Stan as a modification to his motion. Well, I wanted to know if we're going to try and do any cleanup based on all the discussion we've heard today or how do we handle? Well, we're going to put it out for 15 days and I imagine we would get comments back. Uh, many people out there said they would be mailing us comments and, and that would be the process we would normally go through, review the comments at the end of the 15 day period. Okay, but then what we're doing at this point is we're moving it forward as is. Right. Uh, hopefully we'll fix it, uh, given that I think there were some pretty substantive comments about some of the yeah, issues. I, I, think, I think the wisdom of the entire board uh, is, uh, uh, would, would be the one to suggest what needed to be fixed or not. Okay, but if we vote this now and then, you know, we hear the comments but we don't, you know, accommodate any of them, then we'd be just pushing this right through as well, it usually comes back to the board for further yeah. discussion. I think regardless, Ramon, we're not going to finalize this today mm -hmm. because there's going to have to go another 15 day comment period. So regardless of what we do today, we're still going to have to open it up. Yeah, it comes back to the board for further discussion. All right. And we're committed to having to do a 15 day comment just on the draft that went to you yesterday. Um, that would be the version that Stan and Greg approved. Okay. So we're moving this forward, but there's going to be another vote. There's going to be a, another oh, yeah. round of comments and then another vote. Right. So there'll be another vote. Okay. Um, and if I may, I, I had some comments that are more about clarity. I think you heard a couple of them that were related. I can either share those now or I can share them later. But I do think that they are things that the board might want to kind of align or match up. Um, so would, it's uh, your pleasure. I, how, I feel how many like comments I do you have? Um, I can, I can highlight the big ones um, if you'd like. I think you heard the one about the vigilant. Mm -hmm. um, I have a similar concern with uh, good standing in the first section. Where's that? That's under so six. under par 1776, oh, page one, um, you say uh, licensed in good standing. And then elsewhere, you talk about basically not being on probation. I think we need to resolve that inconsistency. So if we change a good standing to not being on probation? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think, or the other terms that I think um, rule people out. So I'm sorry, DEA. 17, we're on page one. Page one, the third full paragraph. The third line at the very end says, and licensed in good standing with the board. And there's so you're a, saying we need to clarify that? I think that term is inconsistent with another provision. I'm sorry, I didn't, it's, it's the, inconsistent with one? Uh, yeah. And not on probation. And not on probation. Okay. Yeah, so. What's the next one, Laura? Good standing can be there. <laughs> um, the next one is, um, I can offer some suggested language on that other entities issue if you'd like. Um, we may want to specify healthcare practitioners' offices mm -hmm. so that it's not the healthcare practitioner themselves that's prohibited right. from depositing, but maybe their um, their office, um, and then we can maybe modify other entities to reflect some commercial purpose mm -hmm. to it. Which um, is that one? That is on. Uh, page two, part E two. At the very end. E two. All right. 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 What are those? Right. Um, and actually, right below that is the provision that deals with the pharmacy that's on probation uh, that can't offer the service. On page three, um, at. 1776.1 sub I. Um, the discussion that you had talked about the pharmacy shall not provide take back um, or a collection receptacle, but the language that's used here is more broad. It talks about take back services, which would include the mail back. Um, so I think you want so to clarify. Collection receptacle. Yes, you could replace services with collection receptacle, and I think that's more consistent with what the discussion the board members had. But obviously, that's up to you. Okay. But there's, a, as it written, there's a little bit of an inconsistency there.
Um, with regard to, um, there is a reference in 1776.3 on page four, subdivis subdivision C um, talks about when the supervising pharmacy is closed. I'm, I'm not sure if supervising has a particular meaning there, but I think we would want to clarify that if it does. Otherwise, maybe the word is just superfluous. So if the pharmacy is closed. Yeah. At the very bottom. Uh, one, two, three, right. fourth line up. It's used, it's used, it's used twice. The pharmacy that's responsible for the collection receptacle in a healthcare facility. But okay. But is that inferred if it says a hospital and clinics with pharmacy on the, preferen on the premises? I don't know if there's multiple pharmacies. Would it mean any pharmacy open would allow? I don't know. I think that was intended to. Do you, do you rarely have more than one hospital pharmacy okay, on a license, start, right? We can start supervising. I'm fine with that. I don't care. But we're, we're striking two things. In the, the bottom of page four. Supervising is in there twice. Then are we going to strike out Debbie's um, ad on within the pharmacy premises and be well on the same page? Mm -hmm. The B. Page 4B. Mm -hmm. Okay. On page 5, uh, this is 1776.3, subdivision G. The very last word um, deals with the once the prescription drug is placed in the collection receptacle, the drug or item cannot be removed or counted. I think in other places you used more elaborate language and I would just recommend that the language that you use be consistent throughout. So that if you say <laughs> inventoried, counted, so we just be, yeah, yeah, just be consistent throughout. Use the same terminology. Okay. Um, in subdivision K, still on page five, um, it says the pharmacy shall maintain a written log to record information about all liners that have been placed into or removed from a collection receptacle. And then it says the log shall contain um, unique identification numbers of unused liners. Well, if it's an unused liner, it may not have been placed in as in the introduction. So I think there's just a little inconsistency there in those two uh, terms. Are they, are they pre numbered? Yeah, the goal is, is you have a, you need to have an inventory number on the liner so that you, I guess, know if one's missing. Before you use them. Before you use them. Okay. So I'm envisioning that you have pi 1 to 10, and you will put one into service, but you know that 2 through 10 are, the, are still there. It's, it's simply that the opening of sub K talks about maintaining the log about only okay. line. I mean, these are clarity. They're not, I don't think they're substantive. Right, okay. it contradicts itself. Um, but, so it's but to the extent that they're inconsistent, we want to fix those before it gets to OAL right. or you're going right. to, it'll get sent back to you. Um, with regard to um, 1776.3 sub N, which is on page six. So that is a provision that says the board shall develop signage to appear on the collection receptacle, receptacle to provide consumer information about the collection process. That's kind of a flag for OAL that says basically you're trying to add language later. Um, so the board can do this without saying that. In other words, if you want to have language available that um, pharmacies can use to place on their um, collection bin, you can do it. But I think um, if you have this language here, OAL will say what language is it, and they'll make you say exactly what the signage so is going to look like. Write it to work around that issue so that we don't. Uh, or you can delete it, and the, unless you it, know what you want the signage to say right now. I don't think at this point we know because part of this is what um, certain individuals have asked that we start. Well, un under M, there's some signage instructions. Right. And the specific signage, and there are things mm -hmm. that um, we've been asked not to list as non-depositable items. Which, which item was that you were just talking about? That's sub subdivision six. N six. on page six. Six. Page six. Oh, wait, she, No, she's referring to I mean, N, N as in Nancy. N, 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 N,
But then there's also signage on N, too. Yeah. It's, yeah. It was N that I was referring. Oh, was um, no. Because because M M is specific no. enough. It says... Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. Although... Although, um, see, now you made me catch it. The, the developed by the board may be also a problem. We may strike that for the same reason. Again, the collection receptacle, you just want to say specifically what needs to be on there in your regulation. Um, Any time you say the board will develop it, then OAL is going to say where is it when the reg comes to them. Um, with regard to 1776.4, on, still on page 6, um, there's a... Um, there's a reference to skilled nurses, to current residents, and um, I know that the DEA regs refer to current or former, um, and I don't know whether or not the board's intention is to capture that or if it was addressed in a different way, but... Um, well, how are you going to get requests if they're former? And how long are they going to, and who's going to give the authority to get rid of them? If, the, if they're no longer in the facility? They died. Uh, yeah, I think it, well, or a transfer, right? They they could have gone to a different facility or something and left their medication behind. Again, that goes back to the it's it's ownership. it it's fine. I'm that one is more of a question to the board. I don't think that one's going to cause you a problem at, at um, our, OAL. So yes. I, our new draft is April twenty fifth. Yes. Which is a update of our draft of February first. Correct. Right. Is this the first time you're looking at either one of these? Um, I looked at the prior iteration. The February 1st? Um, yeah. They, well, the I gave comments prior to Did you to that. give these same comments before today? <clears throat> Some of them I think I've shared with, yeah. But they didn't get, they got missed in the connection. You gave connection. these comments? I don't know that I gave them to you. Who, who specifically. got them? I don't know. I have a copy of my notes. So I know I gave them to somebody. Let me, well, we'll deal with that afterwards. Okay. Is it possible that we could just list all these out and then we can review them when we review the 15-day comments? Can't you? Can we, we can put yeah. them in as 15-day comment changes. Yes. After the come back in as comments back on the draft that, that, that we've got in front of us. Well, how much further do you have to go, Laura? Because I'd like to hear them. Okay. Um, that was actually the majority of them. There's a, I mean, I have a few other like word choices, but those I don't think are significant. Okay. Um, so in terms of the ones with that we could problem with AOL or something like that, uh, you've, you've covered. that OAL, yeah, yeah. I think actually that was the last one. There you go. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. We've had public comment. All those in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain. One abstention. Okay. It's a long time ago, huh? <laughs> all right, so we're going to move on, and in interest of time, I know we've No, we no I'll go uh, uh, abstain to I. Pardon me? Abstain to I. All right. I, okay. All right, do we want to take a break or you want to move on to the other regs? I think we're going to move on to the proposed regulations to try to get those done, which is items 10 through 13.